Hello and welcome to Making Abortion Rare. In this series, we're going to be exploring a strategy to not only make abortion illegal, but to make it unthinkable. I'm Dr. Teresa Burke, and I'm the founding director of Rachel's Vineyard Ministries, which is a healing outreach to men and women who have suffered the loss of a child through abortion to bring the mercy and love of Jesus Christ and his forgiveness to them. And with me is Dr. David Reardon, the founding director of the Elliott Institute. David's been involved in post-abortion research and education for the last 20 years. David and I also recently co-authored Forbidden Grief, the unspoken pain of abortion. So it's such a pleasure to be collaborating here with you at EWTN. Well, it's great to be here with you, Teresa. So really appreciate this opportunity. So David, aside from being one of the nation's leading experts on post-abortion research, you're also the author of a book called Making Abortion Rare. And that's the only comprehensive strategy for ending abortion that I've ever seen published. And that alone is refreshing because many groups are fo focused on one aspect like legislation or healing um, but your strategy is very unique because it brings a very deep understanding of exactly how abortion is hurting men and women and families so that we can build a culture of life can you explore the three prongs of your strategy with us yeah well it's basically built on the idea that uh, everybody knows that abortion hurts an innocent child or at least everyone who's pro-life but the culture accepts abortion because they think it helps women and so we have to address that myth that abortion helps women. And as you and I know from our research and from your work in Rachel's Vineyard, women who've had abortions are actually hurt by the, the experience. And as people realize that, that impacts everything we should be doing as pro-lifers and what, are, what will be most effective in the culture. And so the three prongs are uh, first, uh, outreach to bring more post-abortion healing to those who've had uh, been involved in abortions to make better, no, easier for them to find healing because they will become voices uh, to proclaim uh, the tragedy of abortion, their sorrow about the loss of their children. They will make it easier for other women to find healing and they will become the catalyst for converting our society. I've often said that it's not pro-lifers who are going to end abortion. It's going to be the women who've had abortions who are going to bring an end to abortion. So our job is to be the platform of, for building up and giving these women voice because they're the ones who are going to change the whole cultural attitude where abortion will be unthinkable, where people will, will grow to the point where, uh, as a culture, we'll know that when a woman says, I'm in a desperate situation, I think I should have an abortion, we'll respond just in the same way we would to somebody who says, I wish I were dead. That's a cry for help. That's a cry of despair. And we, as a society, would say, no, we can help you and surround her with love. That's, you know, that's the goal, really, is to have a society that abortion is the unthinkable answer. We don't want to, uh, any woman who's in such desperation needs love and support, not 200 bucks and a, and a ride to the clinic. So that's a good part, uh, an important part of it is then the healing. What you're doing is to m educate the public so they know that Rachel's Vineyard and those kind of services exist. Uh, secondly, is to expose the abortion's dangers just through research and education, which is a lot of what we do, is to educate the public through documented research about how abortion increases suicide rates, how it's associated with depression, so people realize that it's a poor choice that's not a good choice. And as people realize that's a bad option to encourage women, parents and boyfriends and others will maybe think twice before they encourage somebody to have an abortion because they'll be concerned about how it's going to impact her. And of course, as women themselves become more aware of the dangers of abortion, it looks like a less like the easy way out, right? Because yeah. they'll realize, oh, I don't want to face all those problems. So research and education being a second prong. And the third prong would be more the legal and legislative which is looking at uh, ways to make the abortionists fully accountable for the injuries they're causing to women, physical and psychological. Because right now, abortionists, for a variety of reasons which we'll get into, are not paying the price for the harm they're causing to women. L ethically, these doctors have an obligation to protect their, the, these women from making a terrible choice and a poor choice. Yet there's no evidence that abortion actually benefits women's lives. There's all kinds of harms associated with it, yet they're getting uh, off scot-free and if they were held fully accountable the abortion industry would shut down right. we're facing a house of cards here the abortion industry is ready to collapse if ever we expose them to full liability and that's what we're going to be talking about uh, through this series we're going to talk in much greater detail about these things but the 
purpose of any strategy is it to achieve a goal. And in your case, you're looking at much more than simply overturning Roe versus Wade or making abortion illegal. What is your goal? Well, I think the goal, if we, we step back, we don't want to go back to illegal abortions, okay? Just like the other side says we don't want to have illegal abortions, we don't want to have them either. And so, the, you know, again, we have a, a part of the strategy addresses uh, uh, legal remedies to prevent illegal abortions, but also, again, in terms of a, a broader sense, we want to create a cultural shift where abortion is unthinkable, it's recognized as dangerous, it's recognized as a trap as a safety hazard, not a safety net, that it, look, it appears to give a temporary uh, relief, but it's known that it is a terrible option. So as we educate people about that, then uh, we'll uh, draw away from that. So the goal is to make it uh, unthinkable here in the U.S. and in the world because we'll have an impact on the whole world as, as the uh, uh, culture realizes that abortion is uh, harmful to women, then there's no excuse for it. Right, and I know from my own personal experience counseling so many women and men who've suffered the loss of a child through abortion that it is a devastating, terrible traumedy that they struggle with for many, many years. Uh, but how can people who haven't had that personal experience or aren't even in a relationship with someone who's gone through that understand that this is true or generally true? I think it's a, that's where it'd be a good thing to read, like Forbidden Grief, or you, you need to read and listen to the testimonies of women who've had abortions and develop a keen sense of an awareness of uh, the pressures they face, the confusion, the lies, the temptation that if I have this abortion, it'll turn the clock back and my life will be the same way it is. These are all lies, they're misconceptions, and as people r develop tender hearts for women who've had abortions because they understand their pain, they understand the pressures, they understand their confusion, uh, that, that will almost automatically turn you into a healer, someone who can help others. That compassion is so important, it really is, to help them open up and to respond and receive help. Right. The other thing is that we need to understand that there's a God has intertwined the well-being of the woman and child in such a way that to help one, you have to help the other. Okay, you're a mother. You know that if, if I were uh, careless going through a door in a store and I let the door slam on your child's finger. I'd be mad at you. <laughs> yeah, I, I've not only hurt your child, I've hurt you. Yeah. Especially if I, you know, brush it off and walk. You know, that's a deeply offensive too because you are emotionally and spiritually bound to that child. At the same time, if I turn around and the child traps his own finger in the door, so I'm in the clear with you on that. But I go and help him, and oh, you poor little boy, and you see me doing this, you think, oh, what a nice man. Because I helped the child, I helped you. And God's designed it that way. Uh, that God didn't design women to go off on a mountaintop and have a baby by themselves and come back, you know, 30 years later. Uh, he designed women and children to be, uh, well, that he put the baby in a woman's womb. He's designed her womb to protect that baby. They can't be separated. Right. Uh, and that womb is designed to protect the baby. So when you force it open with, with uh, tools to extract the baby, you're going to cause micro-tearing, which is why you have a doubling of risk of miscarriage, OK? You disrupt the woman's hormonal cycle, which is why you have an increased risk of breast cancer. Uh, you in introduce instruments that can cause scarring, which can lead to other reproductive problems. Uh, but even if you could take the baby out entirely safely, which you can't because her body is designed to protect the baby. You're violating her body to destroy the baby. But even if you could take it out, God's designed emotionally and spiritually, as you well know. Yeah. As soon as a woman's pregnant, she is now a mother. And she's developed a relationship with that child, whether she's wanted or not. There's this relationship. And so, uh, as Vince Rue said, you can take the, it out of a woman's uh, body, but how do you take it out of her mind? You can take it out of her mind, that's right. Yeah, and her heart. I you heard a woman say, I wish people understood that the aborted baby never really goes away. Oh, yeah. It, it, it's with her. It, when I, think, I often think of a little subtle example. When a woman's asked years later, how many children do you have? She will answer the number of living children she has. But she thinks of She's the lost ones. She's thinking of the lost ones, that's right. whether they're miscarriages or they're abortions. They're there for her. And so she's constantly reminded of the missing 
ch children. And you know, the, the psychological impact, which we'll, again will go on in greater detail later, it's just really profound. It's the death of a, of a family member and that they have to deal with. And so one of, I guess to get back to a, a key point here is it's in God's design that the woman and the child's best interests are intertwined. And that certainly through our pregnancy centers, we have no, we, that's what we do. We go, we help the woman because in helping the woman, you're Just helping the, the child, yeah. right? Uh, good crisis pregnancy like counselors know that you don't go in when a woman comes in and you start giving her all the fetal information. Here, here's why you have to save your baby. And not focus on the needs that she's struggling right. with that make up abortion. She, she knows, yeah, I have to take care of the baby. Who's going to take care of me? Yeah. Because she has family or boyfriends or others. She's not getting the social support she needs. And so when we help her, we're automatically going to help her baby. And so uh, in a certain sense, this is a, a you know, message to pro-lifers is when we focus on helping women, the rest will kind of follow, take care That's of itself. Right. Because she will, you know, God's designed her to bring the child in the world. In, a, in a, I guess, a very rigid sense, no pro-lifers ever really saved a baby. Pro-lifers have always helped women save their save babies. Their baby. You That's give them right. a friendship, you give her resources, you give her knowledge, you give you her give support, her options. <laughs> options, encouragement. All these things are helping her do her job, which is bring the ch baby into the world because God entrusted the baby to her. Mm -hmm. So when we focus on her, good things will happen. Naturally. Things Just naturally. Course, yeah. And of course, the, the other aspect of it, you know, again, the, the reverse flip side of the coin is whenever you hurt one, you hurt the other. So when you hurt women, you're hurting the children. When you hurt the children through abortion, you're, you're going to hurt the woman. There's no way you can have a safe abortion. Well, you'll break her heart. Right, because it's God's natural design. You mm -hmm. hurt one, you're going to hurt the other. Another thing that's so unique about your strategy is that you, you're not just preaching to the choir. You take the existing mindsets of people into account. And you've done a lot of research to understand what people believe and why they believe those things. Um, and this helps us build on common interests to create a culture of life. Right. I, I use, I divide the public into four groups. Okay, uh, which, you know, I'm not necessarily intending people use this language, but it's useful for me and, I, and for the point of this lesson, is that first there's the pro-lifer, okay, whose heart is fixed on the baby. And the sanctity and of life. Sanctity of life, and we believe that life is destroyed sure. and that abortion is immoral. So that's a, a baby focus, that's pro-life, we're concerned about life. I consider myself pro-life and, and also in the second group, we can belong to two of these groups at a time, the, the connected <laughs> groups. Uh, I'm also anti-abortion. And uh, my heart, when I'm anti-abortion, is fixed on the woman because I believe abortion hurts women. Sure. So I believe both. I believe the sanctity of life and I also believe abortion hurts women. So I have an anti-abortion. So even if you set aside the moral issues, I'm still against abortion because it hurts women. Right. Okay. So we have two reasons to be against abortion. Two very very reasons. powerful reasons. Mm -hmm. Now we look at the other two groups. <clears throat> the third group I will call pro-choice. I know a lot of people don't like those words. In fact, we're encouraging people to talk about poor choice. But anyway, for this example, it's a, it is appropriate. There, there's that mushy middle group out there who don't like abortion. But they've bought into the lies about choice. Who am I to tell other people what to choose? Okay, and if I'm forced to choose from one or the other, I guess I'm going to stand on the side of the woman. And basically what they have done, their heart is fixed on the woman. And they believe abortion helps women. Okay, now we know that's not true, but they believe it. How can you tell the difference between someone that just tolerates abortion because they think it helps versus someone who is out and out, hardcore pro-choice? Well, I think we'd call hardcore pro-abortion. That's why I would call the fourth group is pro-abortion. Their heart is fixed on, not on women, not on the men, or not on the baby. Their heart is fixed on creating utopia here on earth. Because basically there would be the agnostic or atheist mindset that God doesn't have a plan for us, so we might as well make our own perfect world here. Get rid and of the unwanted. And right. And so abortion to them is a social engineering tool. They think abortion is useful to get rid of the unwanted, the poor the children of young girls who aren't fit to be good parents. So they see abortion as a social engineering tool. And they're very resistant to the idea that abortion helps, uh, hurts women, uh, not because, well, they know it does, but they don't care. They figure it's, too, it's okay to, if we injure a few in the process of creating a better world. So the pro-abortionists are the population controllers, okay? The how, how much types. of a percentage would you say that is of? 
I don't know. It's interesting. There was a, a friend who uh, uh, had did a little informal poll outside of abortion clinics when they were having counter protests or whatever, and he asked, he used a good question to tell the difference. He'd ask them, what do you think about forced abortions in China? And about half the activists said, oh, that's terrible, that's wrong. Such a person I would put into the pro-choice category because they really care about women. The others were saying, well, they've got population control problems, you know, and they're making excuses for it. If you make excuses for forced abortions, you're not pro-choice. You're pro-abortion. Right. You're, you, you're, you don't care if women get hurt. Now, the key point is in here that we realize that b between the anti-abortionist and the pro-choice person, as I described it, that's the only place there's common ground. There's common ground between, because both care about women. And the difference in opinion is they think abortion helps women. We know abortion hurts women. And so as we educate people in that group about the dangers of abortion, I've seen this happen in my own relationships. I'm sure you have too. Yeah. <laughs> you, you talk to somebody about, here's what the women go through. Suddenly, to become fit in that pro-choice group where their heart was fixed on the woman, you know what had to happen? They had to harden their heart to the baby. That's right. They, they hardened their heart. They, they didn't want to. They're bothered about the babies being killed. And polls show this all the time. They're bothered by it, but they are hard in their heart because they believe abortion hurts women. They feel it's a terrible thing. It's a necessary evil. It's a necessary evil. I don't like it, but if I have to choose, I'm going to have to decide for the woman. But as they realize that abortion doesn't help women, suddenly their heart begins to thaw. If abortion doesn't help women, why are we killing babies? Right. <laughs> Suddenly, you know, the equation no, no longer makes sense. They were able to, you know, when the scales were tilted to, well, a baby, you know, an unborn, but it's not that developed yet. It dies, but at least this woman's life is saved and she can live a happy life. And as long as there was good coming from it, they were willing to tolerate it. Basically, they're, you know, uh, pragmatists. They're making pragmati pragmatic decisions based on, well, if more good comes from it than evil, I'm going to en endure the, the good. Well, we know that no evil good really comes from, right? And abortion's a pure evil. Right. So, but most people don't know that. So as we, they get educated, that shifts that whole balance of uh, the equation. And the people who care about women uh, are interested in arguments about does abortion help women or not. They're interested in arguments, how are you going to help women right. avoid coerced abortions, for example. I don't think people realize how many abortions in this country are coerced. They're, the decision is made to have them under a tremendous amount of pressure from other people. And it, very few times is actually a woman's desire. But she's operating out of a need to please someone. Or this idea has been given to her by her family, by her boyfriend, by her husband, by her parents. And in many cases, she's operating out of their need, not her own. Oh. Absolutely. In fact, that was, I suppose, to me, one of my first key insights when I was working on uh, Aborted Women Silent No More. I was collecting the testimonies from the Weba women and the, the, the survey that I began. And going into that, I just had the assumption, you know, that abortion hurts women. I, it, I was always been pro-life and always interested in the abortion issue. And back, this was in 1982, when Nancy Jo Mann first started Weba. And uh, I saw a reference to it, and I thought, you know, this is, you know, Everybody's talking about the, the legality and the mor morality, and we're arguing about this, but, you know, if, as a Catholic raised to believe that sin leads, you know, God's not trying to, when he gives us these laws, it's not to end the party and That's to right. deprive us of the fun. It's to lead us to happiness. And so when you cross the line here, the presumption is that's going to lead to despair. It's going to lead to problems. And so when I heard about Nancy Joe's program, you know, that these women were having problems, I thought, well, that's got to be very typical. So I thought, and people need to know that because that goes to the heart of the question of whether or not it's abortion is a good choice or a poor choice in terms of just, is it going to benefit women's lives? And then I know it's a poor choice. But what struck me when I began getting those testimonies back was how heartbreaking the situations were that were driving so many women to choose an abortion. That it was yeah. counter to what they wanted to do. I mean, we've got horrible stories of women uh, being pressured into abortions. And, in that survey, about 59% of, of the Weeman women said that they felt uh, highly forced by others to have the abortion, and over 80% said they would have carried a term if they'd had support from others. And that's been my experience in Rachel's Vineyard retreats as well, that you just weep when you hear the deciding factors, the pressures that women experience, the lack of support and the complete <coughs> abandonment from their partners. 
Right. I, I mean, one of these testimonies I refer to often, I call the girl Tracy, she, she describes how her parents and boyfriends badgering her. She keeps telling them, I don't want to have the abortion. She'd seen the silent scream in t uh, at school. She's like, I don't want to do this. But she faced all these pressures to give into it. And uh, I called, she, finally she just, to tell everybody to, to have the, she'd have the abortion just to shut them up. To get them off her back. Get them off yeah. her back. She yeah. gave, gave in. As one woman described it, she didn't decide to have the abortion. She said she decided to be weak. She decided to let other people right. make the decision for her. And she was going to give in to all their pressures because she just didn't have the strength to resist it. Right. And, and so, I know of women who will tell her that people were calling them on their telephone throughout the night, all hours, saying, you know, did you schedule that abortion? When are you going to have it? How can you do this to us? Oh, yeah. Like, how can you have a baby? How that hurts us. Oh, yeah. It, yeah. It's just so tremendous all, Very often pressure. that's a boyfriend kind of harassing. Or the boyfriend's mother. Oh, mother. I've oh, heard yeah. that a lot. The family members, they all begin the harassment, you know, mm -hmm. and then they'll, they'll lobby her family to get right. in on the harassment. And this girl gets to the abortion clinic, what's going to happen, Teresa? Uh, is the abortion clinic going to say, oh, this is going against your conscience, you shouldn't do this? No, they're going <laughs> to open the door and welcome her in. And They're going to cooperate with the harassers. They're going to cooperate with the, her saying, this is what you have to do. And they'll participate, basically, in tearing down her self-esteem. Part of her is saying, well, things will work out. You know, I, I, if I have this baby, things can work out. But the abortion clinic, this one gal in a written thing says, if a teenager comes in saying, I'm going to have this, uh, I want to have this baby, she'll say to her, but do you know how much it costs to have a baby? Right. It costs $5,000. Do you have that kind of money? Well, no. How are you going to pay for this? How are you going to pay yeah. for, for raising the child? Don't you want to be a good mother? Well, they focus on the fears. And then I've also heard women describe a moment of surrender when it's like they've been arguing and arguing with themselves, with other people, and then they just hit this moment of surrender so that when the clinic worker says, is this your choice, it's like, yes, because yeah. they, they, just they just give, give up. up. Well, you know, that's, uh, when abortion was illegal, women could answer back, no, this is dangerous. This is illegal. This is immoral. Now that's legal, everybody's telling them, no, it's got to be moral. It wouldn't be legal if it's not moral. And everybody does it <laughs> it's and there's legal. no problem. There's no yeah. problems. It's healthy. It's safe. So yeah. she has no resistance against the abortion other than her heart saying, but this is wrong. I want my No baby. rational excuses. Yeah, every, all of her explanations don't sound rational in a culture that says abortion's mm -hmm. safe, abortion's good, you know, you can go on with your life. And so, and in a certain sense, again, this is part of the deception. Those family members are pressuring her to have the abortion because they have bought into the lie that abortion's safe. And if they realized that they were imposing all this heartache on her, they, they would back off. They would be supportive. But the lie is the abortion uh, is neutral, sets the clock back. And it's a lie perpetuated by the pro-abortionists who are the population controllers who want to use abortion as a social engineering tool. And They're very effective at it because it does give a tremendous amount of manipulation to a woman at a time of crisis. And women are easily manipulated when they're confused, when they're afraid, when right. they're in crisis. Right. I mean, as you study crisis theory, when a person's in a state of crisis, they're more easily influenced by the opinions of others, especially those who are experts. And when the experts are saying, oh, yeah, this will solve your problem, and the doctor or the abortion counselor, the school counselor, often school counselors are very influential Persuasive, in abortion yeah. decisions. Right. They, they, they trust these older people who are going to get them out of their problems. And they find out that these older people don't know what they're talking about. And also, often, and we'll talk about this later because I know we're running out of time, but often these older people, they have their agenda. They want her to have an abortion because, you know, maybe it's, it's their grandchild and they don't want to have to be, take bothered, it, with they, it, yeah. be bothered with it. Or uh, they're the abortion clinic counselor and this woman uh, doesn't seem very bright. She seems poor. She doesn't seem like somebody I, w I would want to be raising children. Shouldn't be a parent. Yeah, shouldn't yeah. be a parent. So, so they're bringing their own prejudices and biases, That's right. deep biases against that woman. They're not trying to help her. They're trying to deprive her of the ability to bring that child in the world because every abortion involves another person coming into the world. So it's a social context and people who have a social engineering view right. want to get rid of these uh, excess Miles. Yeah, David, I want to thank you for what you've shared with us today. And in our next segment, we're going to look at mercy being more powerful than shame. Do you have any final thoughts? Uh, no, thank you. Uh, for, <laughs> and uh, if people want to get more about this, we've got some reports at uh, makingabortionrare.com. And if people want some help with uh, past abortion, they can contact Rachel's Vineyard Ministries.
Hello and welcome to Making Abortion Rare. In this series, we're exploring a strategy to not only make abortion illegal, but to make it unthinkable. I'm Dr. Teresa Burke, and I'm the founding director of Rachel's Vineyard Ministries, which is a healing and training outreach to bring the love and mercy of Jesus Christ to women and men and grandparents who've suffered the loss of a child through abortion. And with me is my friend and colleague, Dr. David Reardon. David's the founding director of the Elliott Institute, and he's been involved in post-abortion research and education for the last 20 years. Welcome, David. In Thank this you. segment, we're going to look at why women have abortions and why it's so difficult for them to accept God's mercy and forgiveness afterwards. And this is going to lead us to an understanding of how we're all called to be instruments of conversion and messengers of His divine mercy. I think that's an important point, is that everybody has a role in this transformation of the culture, which has to begin, or at least a key component is, bringing healing to those who've already been involved in abortion. And we need everyone to play their piece. What's the research telling us about why women have abortions? Well, it, as we discussed last time, it's a lot of pressure. I suppose the boyfriend is the, or the male partner is the biggest factor, his reaction to the pregnancy, okay? Uh, and then, of course, extended family and everybody else. So it's, uh, most abortions are for social reasons because there's social pressures or social concerns of how it's going to impact her other relationships. Very often a woman is basically feels that she has to, well, a good example would be a husband or boyfriend saying, if you have this baby, I'm out of here. Right, abandonment. Abandonment. She's put in the very unfair situation of choosing between two people she loves. She loves her child, she loves this man, she wants to hang on to it and she feels she has to give up one in order to save the other. There's a lot of uh, women who also have to um, choose abortion in their minds because of schooling. There isn't adequate resources on any college campus to assist them in giving life and still continuing education. And particularly with families where education was esteemed as such a value, women feel that I've ruined my parents' um, plans for my entire yeah. life, that they've been building and saving for, and I know a lot of women have abortions when they fear their schooling will be interrupted and that mom and dad will be so angry right. because this is their dream for me. And often they're pre-programmed, like you said, that the family, they're raised with the idea that if you ever have an abortion, or you ever get pregnant, you're going to have, the abor have an abortion. And they just know that. One woman actually had a talk show once called in, and I, she was saying, well, I'm pro-choice. And I said, well, if you're pro-choice, then you'll at least agree with me that we should do something to stop forced abortions. And she said, well, I tell my daughter that if she ever gets pregnant, she's going to have an abortion. And I'm like, so you're pro-choice for everybody but your daughter, <laughs> in which cases you have to have an abortion. And it, it does show a mindset, but some young women, you know, as you say, they will say that, that as when they got pregnant, either A, they immediately knew, well, I have to have an abortion because that's what we do, or they don't want to have the abortion, but they know their parents are going to insist on it. And a lot of parents do insist on it. Oh, yeah, it absolutely. With a lot of pressure. I think some of these cases of the, of the women abandoning a newborn baby are because they hid the pregnancy from their parents knowing their parents would force them to have the abortion. But they don't want to have an abortion, so they're hiding the pregnancy. Well, when the baby comes, how are you going to hide the baby? And yeah. they still feel all this tension, this fear of their parents' reactions, and so they abandon the babies because they don't, never, they, it's not, the, I think some of these cases, and I don't know this for certain, but I, don't th I think they're not abandoning the baby with malice towards the baby. It's just such fear of s losing their social acceptance with parents or others. That, that they keep delaying, what am I going to do? I, they're right. just trying to hide. Well, you want it. the approval of the people who are most important to you. And when their approval is pushing for abortion, it's hard to give in right. to for a lot of women. Yeah, I think I use the term sometimes where women, before they go through a physical abortion, go through a social abortion, where all the network supporting them, their parents, their boyfriends, all the people they count on to be supportive are cutting them off and saying, if you do this, you're on your own. And as I said before, if women are, God didn't design women to get pregnant and go off on a mountaintop and have a baby by themselves. He designed women to get pregnant in a marriage with a supportive husband in a community of family members on both sides, all applauding, saying, oh, you're going to have a baby, and a welcoming society where every woman saying, I'm going to have a baby, 
is welcomed and supported. Oh, isn't that great? And that's a much bit different mindset, as you know, yeah. when all your family are saying, oh, that's great, you're, you're going to have a baby, versus, oh, what are you going to do? You, know, you can't expect us to help out. That's you, you right. know, and that's a, you know, you are basically being told, if you do this, you're on your own. And like I said, that's a scary, that's very intimidating, especially for a young woman who's very dependent on these relationships, is very relationship oriented, to have the threat of all these relationships being pulled away. And when you're pregnant, that's when you crave it and you need it the most. You oh. want the support of other people. You want their approval. You want their right. affirmation. Yes, the society, you know, God's plan, again, going back to natural laws for society and families and husbands to all be supportive and happy about a pregnancy. Because you feel needy. How, how many women would want to have an abortion if they were getting all the support? Even if they, you know, are worn out and have all kinds of problems, if they're getting enough support from others, that gives them the encouragement and hope that, you know, it's going to work out. In many cases, the permission. A lot of women don't feel they have permission to have their baby right. because of all the pressures. There really are a lot of pressures facing women. And uh, Frederica Matthews Green, a pro-life feminist, she used this analogy that a woman doesn't want an abortion in the same way that she wants an ice cream cone or a Porsche. A woman wants an abortion in the way that an animal wants to chew its leg off when its leg is caught in a trap. So what we're really looking at here is escape through an act of self-destruction. Very much so. And the pro-abortion, to extend that analogy a little bit, you have this animal with its leg caught in a trap. The pro-abortion solution is to bring along the hacksaw, we'll cut the leg right off. That's right. <laughs> and we're going to maim you and set you free. But you're free, okay? Then the, the woman is maimed emotionally and physically but she's free from the trap of whatever Crisis problems were, were connected with that pregnancy because there's social problems that were connected. She's free of that, mm -hmm. but she's maimed forever. The pro-life solution, of course, is let's open the trap. We don't need to maim you. You don't need to sacrifice your baby. Let's build a new social support mechanism. Let's educate your family. Let's educate your boyfriend. I mean, really, the odds are best if a woman's trying to keep her boyfriend. If she keeps the baby, <laughs> it's more likely the boyfriend will, uh, you know, get used to it. Love the baby. That's why it takes nine back. months to have yeah, a baby. Nine months. Yeah. Every time I have five kids and I know you have six, and every time I was pregnant, it was always a surprise. Not that we don't know how it happens, but <laughs> the awesome reality of bringing life into the world, a new human being, it's so overwhelming, even when it's planned and wanted. And so I truly believe that we do need nine months to prepare and to adjust to the idea. And that I, I think men be... need ten months. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Seriously, because e even, you know, when uh, my wife was pregnant the first time, Time, and I think even the other ones, even though I could even feel the baby moving inside her, to me it was still a little more intellectual. I think women are loving and touching the baby, you know, they, they have a, a more intimate, immediate sense of relationship. It's not real until it comes right. out but from for, the man. For, for me, yeah, I mean, it yeah. became more, I, intellectually I understood what was going to happen, but you know, and I was anticipating it and, and everything, but it was still, it just seemed so unreal. Yeah. It seemed unreal, I thought, oh, wow, oh, this baby's moving around, it, it, there's an unrealness about it for the male. And I think, uh, so, it, which is finally born and you, and you get to see it. And so that, that's the completion of it for the man, where I think the woman's going through that bonding earlier. But I think one of the things to understand is this pressure to go, to make a choice, to save something. Uh, there's a, uh, a Jewish sociologist, Zygmunt Bauman, who did research uh, with uh, Jews in the, uh, following the Holocaust where he'd interview the Jews. And during the, during the Nazi persecution, they would put the Jews all into a ghettos areas, and they would make the Jews select certain leaders. And then they'd work with these leaders and say, OK, give us a list of everybody who's in the group. Do this or do that. And they'd get these leaders to cooperate with the Nazi commandants. How did they do that? By threatening. If you don't do this, we're going to kill you or your family or somebody else, you know, whatever. So. As long, Bauman's insight was, as long as the Jewish leaders thought they had something to save, they would do things that they knew were wrong. For example, when it got to the point, give us 20 people who are going to go off to a work camp, even though they knew that meant the death of those 20 people. They cooperated with the evil because they thought they would at least save the others. They had something to save, yeah. yeah. Now, bring the psychology to the abortion issue. Women go against their conscience. Seventy percent of women, at least, and I'm sure it's probably higher, seventy percent admit that abortion's morally wrong. They're acting against their conscience. So when you hear the pro-choicers say, oh, let everybody choose according to their conscience, that's not what's happening in the clinic. They're choosing in violation of their conscience. They're violating their yeah. conscience because 
they think they, that's the only way to save these other things that are valuable. They have to give up their baby in order to save a uh, uh, relationship. Uh, was it Carol Gilligan, wasn't she the uh, feminist so yeah. sociologist who basically said, you know, oh, but this is fine for women to, to go against their conscience and have abortions because that's just their different way of making a moral decision to satisfy other people. She, how, how she couldn't see this as abuse of women, yeah. I don't know. But uh, so it's that temptation. And abortion the, clinics really play into that temptation because they frequently encourage a woman to view abortion as her only choice. They don't provide a whole lot of information about alternatives, none. Right. And they well, fight laws that require that they would. I think not only that, but they will, uh, they'll ask, they'll, they'll tear, tear her down, tear her down a, a girl's self-esteem that you're not fit to be a parent, basically. Are you ready to be a good mother? Do, do you want, let's start, do you want to be a good mother? Well, of course, yeah. Are you ready to be a good mother? Well, I don't know. Don't you think your, mother, your child deserves to have, have a, a, a father in his house? Well, you'd be better, okay? Don't you think you'd be a better mother if you waited in the future? Well, maybe. And so basically they tear down her a sense of her, her ability to be a good mother. And, make and she her ends feel, up agreeing with them because right. they're bringing out points right. that everyone's right. insecure about. And, and, and they make her, they, you know, you're actually being selfish to have this baby and make Johnny unable to go to school make your parents have to support you. You're just being selfish to bring, they can make her feel guilty <laughs> about bringing your life into the world because she's not ready to be a good parent. She's not in a, per, in a house with two cars and everything. You know, so they make her feel incapable and actually the generous thing to do is have the abortion and have another baby someday. You know what, I, th I see that same exact thing, especially with women who have, are carrying children with defects, Down syndrome. There isn't support in the hospitals and in the counseling to have the baby. It's all this genetic screening that encourages her to have an abortion. And uh, women who would feel like they would want to raise their child, there isn't any support or education um, in a lot of places. And I've, heard, I've just heard that from so many women who, yeah. you know, came up with a bad diagnosis. Well, yeah, and again, what's driving that, as I said before? Fear. It's, it, it, well, it's, but Inadequacy. The, what's, what's, what's driving the, the, the diagnosis? We've got search and destroy um, mentality from academics and intellectuals who are really still living the eugenics mentality of Nazi Germany. We we're just talking about the Germans to get rid of the unfit. And if we can target the unfit, we don't, we don't want to bring these people, because we see suffering or at least, let's say, the secular world sees suffering as just pure evil, not suffering as something that draws us to a deeper understanding of Christ and our own salvation. They don't see the care of a uh, innocent child with, with Down syndrome as something that is spiritually awakening of love and you know a great thing. They see it. Oh, that's just you know a person who's defective. So they see the defect, not the person. They don't see the dignity of of Christ and and God in human person, and so. This mentality flows through in all these counselors and advice. And again, when people are faced with the uh, tragedy of a child with uh, uh, some handicap, that's disorienting. That's right. It's disappointing. It's confusing. It's overwhelming. And when people start th throwing, here's the solution, it's very tempting to follow you know, what everybody's telling you is the best way to go because they're the experts. Right. And you feel despair in being able to handle the situation. Right. That same despair and abandonment um, leads a lot of women to choose abortion. And it's that same despair afterwards that makes it so hard for them to accept healing. Oh, very much. I think if you, if you had a single word to describe abortion, bef both before and after, what's going on, it's despair. I, there's a good analogy built to, you know, that I like that uh, Archbishop Fulton Sheen gave about before sin and after sin, how before sin, the devil's our advocate and Satan and, and Christ is our uh, opponent. And after sin, Christ is our advocate and Satan is our opponent. And our to, accuser. Our accuser. But, but yeah, but basically it, it goes kind of like this to, to apply to abortion, that before an abortion, Satan's saying, you got to get control of your life. You've got to have this abortion to save your reputation. You've got to have this abortion to save your boyfriend. If you have the abortion, everything will turn out all right. Okay? And Jesus, is, of course, with his arms outstretched like on a cross, is saying, no, don't go this way. You don't, can't know the future, but trust that God has a plan for you. Just trust and then welcome this life. But after the abortion, Satan then becomes the accuser. 
You killed your child. Who could do anything more evil than that? No man could ever really love you, so you better keep this a secret, okay? Uh, the, the people at church, if they knew, they'd throw you out, okay? Right. They'd hate you because you're an evil person. You might as well bury yourself in drugs and alcohol and sex and, you know, self-destructive behaviors or just bury yourself in work. You better keep yourself busy because you don't want to be thinking about this, okay? You better not, and God can never forgive you for this. Right. This is the big one. You'll never be forgiven, right? There's a lot of this despair. That's exactly you know, how women feel. It's exactly. They're afraid, right? And yeah. of course, Jesus is saying, no, come to me. I can heal you. And it's so hard to, you know, this temptation, even for women who've, who've been through a lot of healing, there's this temptation. Satan will continue to gnaw at them, to doubt that they're really forgiven. Or even if God's forgiven you, well, people aren't going to forgive you. And that's, again, where, as a culture, the pro-life culture, we have to free women from that trap. We have to wear our compassion on our sleeve. We have to be the ones saying, you can come to us. Because even though we value life, even though we know you made a mistake, even though we know it was a sin, we're all sinners. We've been there. We've, we've accepted Christ's mercy, and we want you to accept that mercy too. Because we have to make women really, really comfortable with the idea that they can share with us. Because uh, let's step back. If we were not doing that, this is what the typical post-abortive woman and man sees right now. They see two options, two people out there. When they're feeling pain about a past abortion, and they want to talk to somebody. They can talk to somebody who is pro-choice, or I'd call poor choice, uh, and say, <clears throat> you know, I had an abortion a few years ago, and sometimes I feel bad about it. And well, how are they going to respond? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they're going to say, you know, you can have another baby someday. You made the right choice at the time. You were young. You didn't you were know what young. you were doing. It's fine. You know, don't think about it. Was it really a baby yet? Okay, whatever right. cliches they use to try to uh, dismiss it. or to be, They're trying to be comforting. But they don't for, want her to dwell that it was a mistake that needs repentance. Right. Because they don't want to make her feel bad. Right. They're trying to protect her from feeling bad. Right. But, of course, what she's really trying to do is process her grief, right? Sure. And so what the, the unintended message is... Your grief isn't important. Your grief isn't valid. It can be made up for by having another baby. And you don't made the tell right me choice. about it. <laughs> yeah, and, and don't tell me. Because obviously, you know, anyone t touching and bringing up the abortion issue, most people are going to feel uncomfortable. And well, course, they can't do anything to fix it, they think. <clears throat> right. So it's better not to even go there than to right. risk making a woman feel bad. Right. And then, but to pro-lifer, she's not inclined to go to a pro-lifer. Uh, because especially if she sees somebody who's very vocally pro-life, Unless she sees clear evidence of mercy in that person, she's not going to assume there's mercy, is she, right? Well, she'll think they would never understand what she right. did, why she felt she had to do it. And right. The assumption it. is, you're going to judge me. Because, mm -hmm. again, remembering the analogy of Satan, Satan's going to put in her heart, don't go to that Christian person, because they're going to judge you. They, they know abortion's evil. Right. And they judge, because there's this confusion between sin and sinner, right? You know? And the, and the sinner especially has this confusion that if you oppose the sin, you oppose me. That's right. You reject me. Right. And so we need to make extra clear that when we oppose the sin, we care deeply about those who are caught up in that. And we're trying to help them. Okay. And so we have to break through that because they're afraid to go to the pro-lifer. And so that's, what, again, like we have to wear our compassion on our sleeve and be keenly aware every thing we say is, can be heard by somebody who's had a past abortion. And what we say, is that opening the path to healing, or is it playing into the hands of despair? So when somebody says, says for example, I've had, you know, women who said, I used to always say this, you know, at a coffee table would say, you know, abortion issue comes up, and some woman who led, led a life where she never faced these pressures says, I never understand how, I, you know, I just can't understand how someone could have an abortion. And you're the last person I would ever tell. Yeah. I didn't mean it in, 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 a, in a bad way, but if you were the one with the abortion, you're thinking, you hear only an evil person could have an abortion, so you hear judgment. And you feel, you must think I'm evil, right. and so and I was, how could and I? And plus, you just said you could never understand, so how could I ever share my stuff? Because right. you're just saying you can't understand. Whereas instead, if we said, you know, I saw this TV sh sh show, and I heard these experts, and if you sat down at a coffee table, here's a good recommendation for people. If you say, sit down at a coffee t table tomorrow and say, I never understood before the pressures that a woman faces to have an abortion. 
that's a totally different dynamic, isn't it? Oh, it sure I, is. I, I it never, invites conversation. It, it shows it's, it's you're also, not there to judge them. It also admits humility. I never understood before. Yeah. I never understood before, but I saw the show and I and I found out about all the pressures that women face, and I really, and I, I, my heart goes out to them with all the things they face afterwards, the feelings of isolation and anger and, and loneliness and guilt and shame and, and longing for the baby. You know, just you don't have to mention the whole long list, but just mention a few things of empathy towards those who are having the problems. And you could say, and, but the good thing is, I was really surprised. I didn't even know they had all these great programs to help women find healing after an abortion. Now you've just planted seeds. Instead of setting up a little obstacle, like I don't understand how people who have abortions, or abor anyone who has abortion, you know, that's, that's terrible. Instead you're saying, oh, now I understand the pressures women face. So you feed understanding, then you feed their heart, understand what they're feeling in their hearts. And well, you give, giving and, seeds and, of and, hope. And you give hope right. that there's programs out there to provide healing, and I'm going to try to support those, because I think that's great. It's a very important thing. There's all these women who've had abortions, and we need to uh, help them find healing. Yeah. Now, somebody hears that, they're not going to immediately turn around and say, oh, let me tell you about my abortion. But you're planting a seed, right? And how long does it take a, a typical for these seeds to, to Oh, bloom? it can take a while. Well, there's so much despair after abortion. Um, despair in the sense of fear, fearing God's punishment. I've heard stories of women going out. One woman standing in the puddle of a lightning storm, waiting for God to strike her dead. Other women walking across nine lanes of traffic, just saying, come punish me now, let's get it over with. The despair is just unbelievable, and the isolation that they suffer in their silent secret that they're not able to share because they think people don't understand. So we really do need to be beacons of hope and, and a welcoming church that says, therefore, but the grace of God go I. Right. Uh, we have, like I said, and I can't stress this strong enough, we have to wear our compassion on our sleeve. They're not going to assume that we won't judge them. They don't assume that we actually practice our Christian ethics <laughs> and yeah. that we actually are Christ-like. They don't assume that. But they have to be embraced on the level of, uh, of understanding so they feel safe to confide their secret and pain to us. And I think a good way to be able to convey that attitude is to develop a better understanding of what women go through, to listen to the stories, to, in a sense, allow your own heart to be broken over the impact that this has had on their lives, the devastation, the years right. lost. A lot of times when women come for help, it's 30, 40 years later. Right. And in that time period, she's suffered grievously. Right. So to be able to offer that compassion and an understanding, that's why I love you know, our efforts to educate about the trauma of abortion invite folks to read Forbidden Grief so that they really have a deep understanding of not only what she goes through, but the obstacles that are making it hard for her. Right. I think anyone who reads a book like Forbidden Grief will have a transformation of their attitudes, a deepening of, of compassion for women. I mean, they, maybe they already do on some level. Yeah, you know, I believe in God's mercy and everything. But you almost have to have a deep sense of, oh, there but for the grace of God go I, or thank you, Lord, that I was spared this trial, because it is a real trial. And the other part of the despair is this doubt that God can forgive, even if these, and this is where, by being examples of mercy, we're giving the message that if you can be merciful to me, then maybe God can forgive me, because there's this doubt that God can forgive, and it's hard to forgive themselves. And when you think about it, I think a striking thing for early Christians and on up today is that God's mercy is so incredible. And the key word in incredible is not credible. I mean, the, the root words are, it's not believable. It's not believable that God is so merciful that he would forgive me even for killing my own child. Because that's the deep, you know, the deep fear is that, you know, what could I do worse than killing my own child? And so when you trust in God's mercy, uh, it takes, that's hard to do, and it's, uh, many women will go back to confession again and again because they're doubting that mercy. It's because psychologically they need that support and the example of a community, of the priest, the people in the church, of others saying, we're here, we understand. And by that example of mercy, we show God's mercy. She's able to feel it through the love that we show, through the compassion right. that we show. And God has only one hands and feet on earth. It's us to, right. to proclaim that message, that good news and that hope. I'd like to thank you for joining us here at EWTN to learn more ways how we can build a culture of life. Uh, please look at our website at makingabortionrare.com and you can link to Rachel's Vineyard from there. And David, thank you. Thank you, Patricia.
Hello and welcome to Making Abortion Rare, where we're exploring a strategy to not only make abortion illegal, but to make it unthinkable. I'm Dr. Teresa Burke, and I am the founding director of Rachel's Vineyard Ministries, which provides weekend retreats for healing after abortion. And with me is my friend and colleague, Dr. David Reardon. He's the founding director of the Elliott Institute. In today's show, we're going to be looking at, in more detail why women have abortions and what we can do as individuals and members of the church to reach out to them with the love and mercy of Jesus Christ. David, there's been a lot of research that you've done. In fact, you're the nation's leading expert in research after abortion. And how many people are affected by post-abortion reactions that you've learned about? Well, I think it's uh, obviously a controversial area, and any study is going to be called in question as to what the per actual percentages are. We know that women have problems. I often like to respond with a quote from uh, Dr. Julius Fogel, who was a... Uh, uh, psychiatrist and also an obstetrician who performed 20,000 abortions himself. Mm -hmm. So, he, you know, this isn't a pro-life zealot, right? But he said that, uh, let me quote, every woman has a trauma at destroying a pregnancy. This is a part of her own life. She destroys a, when she destroys a pregnancy, she destroys a part of herself. A psychological price is paid. I know that as a psychiatrist. Now, here's a guy who knows that every woman, he says, is traumatized on some level. He, he went on to describe it. it could be a hardening of maternal instinct, it could be depression, it could be withdrawal from others, but some psychological price is paid because you're destroying a life force, if nothing else. You can, you can argue about, you know, he would argue whether or not it's a person or not, I suppose, but it's a life. Something's growing there. And so he said every woman pays a price. Uh, I think it's very clear all the research, even from the most uh, zealous of the poor choice researchers, indicates that 20 percent or more of women who have an abortion with whatever time frame they look at have some uh, severe psychological response to it. And the problem with those studies is they only look over short time periods and as you know it can be often delayed, right? Right. Uh, what in your practice, you know, how often, there's, when do people come in? There's a very large continuum of reactions and some women are affected immediately right after the procedure and other women there's a delayed onset 15, 20, 30, 40 years sometimes. Right. Depends on, on their individual's coping mechanisms. That's right. And they will, some will very successfully push it down and not think about it. They really can go on and not think about it. It doesn't bother them for years until some later event triggers it, you know, maybe birth of another child or difficulty getting pregnant or the death of a loved one. Yeah, you know, we have a great story in Forbidden Grief about the woman who was triggered by the death of her dog. That's right. Her right? dog was, dies and that, that experience with death and the same thing can happen when a parent dies or someone close to you or another child and then all the memories and feelings and emotions related to a past abortion surface and they've got to be dealt with and that can be a really devastating um, scary time because most women don't know that people have problems after abortion. Right, well, they, yeah, they're, they're confused because I shouldn't be feeling this way. They're told the normal reaction is to feel relief. Right. And when you feel guilt and other things, you feel like, well, what's wrong with me that I'm not just feeling this relief? Uh, the Los Angeles Times did a poll, national survey of women and men, uh, and they asked in their poll about abortion attitudes, have you ever had an abortion is one of the later questions. And it was interesting because they only had like 10% of the women admitting had a past abortion. So most women who had abortions wouldn't even admit it in an anonymous poll. But of those who admitted having abortions, over half of the women and two-thirds of the men, more of the men even than women, admitted that they had guilt about the experience. That's very significant. Right. For and then, men and women. Yeah. And then uh, about, uh, I think it was a third, uh, described it as murder. They described their own abortions as murder. And over 70% believed it was immoral. So they believe it's immoral. So again, there, you see a deep sense of regret, guilt, uh, moral conflict over these past abortions in this random poll. And I think that's pretty indicative of the general population. With so many people harboring so much unresolved guilt and grief and sadness, um, it's no wonder abortion is the most controversial topic of our age. <clears throat> yeah, I think you have to remember, it's not just these women, okay? It's the men involved. There's the grandparents of the child aborted. The, or the roommate parents, who pays for it. The roommate, a counselor, 
other people who would advise for it. So basic, basically you have a whole population where I think very literally every family is touched by abortion. Maybe not with immediately within that family, but certainly at the level of a cousin or a uh, you know, close relative or, or neighbor nearby. Every, everybody's touched by someone who has abortion. A lot of men don't know anybody who's had abortion. Most women, you'd right. probably agree, no, because women tend to admit that more. Not to, always. For, well, not always. <laughs> yeah. but, but I mean, but let's put it this way. Most women know more people who have, they, they don't. They'll there, talk there, about there, it more There are more women they, than they know who have abortions in their lives. They may think they only know two women have an abortion. Right. They probably really know about 14, but, they, but they, at least they have had one or two women friends who've admitted that they have some knowledge had an abortion, so they're at least aware of it. Men may not, not know at all, like unless they were involved in abortion, right. that uh, somebody they know has been involved in abortion. I think we also need to look at, at pro-life activists, even as a group who struggles with anxiety and depression over their inability to stop abortions. Um, that has a psychological impact. 30 years of fighting it, you know, the sense of helplessness, the awareness of what is being destroyed in abortion and not being able to stop it. And that's a whole other set of psychological angst that people right. have to contend with. People sometimes will get a sense of depression uh, because they try to do pro-life activities and they don't feel like they're making a difference. They don't feel like, you know, well, the society's getting away from us. In fact, in, when abortion was first legalized back in the se early se 70s, which I remember the discussion, or at least reading in a couple places, that there's this concern that if we don't pass a constitutional amendment to reverse Roe v. Wade within five years, the number of people who've been involved in abortion is going to grow and grow and grow, and you're going to get this big uh, mass of people who are resistant to changing resistant judgment because they basically have, they've got blood on their, their hands, they have all these psychological issues of defensiveness and uh, unwillingness to consider abortion, and so it will become impacted in our society and we'll lose our chance. That was the prediction. And in a certain sense, it's somewhat borne out. We have not significantly reversed things because the population of women and men and families exposed to abortion has grown and grown and grown. But what we are seeing now, and this is really kind of a revelation of the last 10 years, is that as post-abortion movement grows and grows and grows, we've got a reverse dynamic. God's mercy is coming in, and all the souls that have been broken through abortion now need healing. Right. You know, <laughs> Satan has his day, or his hour, and Jesus has his day. And so we're seeing a reverse dynamic as more and more women find healing. They're spreading it to all these women they know. You know, I went through a, a Rachel's Vineyard retreat, my life so much better, and they see them lit up with joy in women who haven't been, who want that joy back in their hearts. They want that peace. Well, the Holy Father had predicted in the Gospel of Life that women, when they've gone through healing, would become the most eloquent defenders of life. And I know that Rachel's Vineyard spread to nine countries now, many languages, because of the efforts of women who've been healed and want to bring this to their friends, to their families, to their countries where they're from. So it's just an amazing thing that's happening. I want to back up for a minute and look at the specific behavioral impact of abortion. You've done so much research. You probably more published than any author at this point on um, detriment of abortion. Um, the substance abuse issue is something that you've studied in depth. Can you talk about that and share what right. your research findings have discovered? We've done we've got about three studies, that uh, two of which have already published in peer-reviewed journals. And there's actually 17, not beyond ours, there's 17 studies at least showing increased levels of substance abuse following an abortion. The most recent one we published found that women who are pregnant bringing another child to term, those with a history of abortion are more likely to use drugs and alcohol during the subsequent pregnancy. Because the pregnancy is triggering their <coughs> memories and feelings and that's the time they want to numb what they're remembering exactly. through drugs and alcohol. Right. So that puts the baby at risk and puts her fetal at risk, defects. Right. And In one of our studies we did, we exclude women with a prior history of substance abuse because you can't be sure, you know, is abortion aggravating it or whatever, but excluding women who had prior history of, of substance abuse, those who had an unintended pregnancy who they carried a term and those who had abortions, those who had abortions had six times more substance abuse uh, in the, admitted using drugs and alcohol. In fact, about 14 percent described themselves as becoming alcoholic and, and another 14 percent described themselves as becoming uh, substance abusers. 16 so, percent. Right, of, of, of the women who had the abortion. So, uh, 
it's very uh, basically self-medicating. Okay, they've got these issues they don't know how to deal with, and so they just try to bury it in drugs and alcohol. Uh, sexual promiscuity will be another means where women will try to bury that. Uh, we have interesting uh, data that shows that women who have uh, abortions, for example, in the California Medicaid study, that uh, women who have abortions are very likely to become pregnant. Uh, in fact, on average, they become pregnant. Guess how many, how many days? On the anniversary of their abortion. About 368 <laughs> days after the abortion, on average, these or women are pregnant date. again. And so uh, that's to re replacement pregnancy thing. It should tell us something about public policy. I mean, the public, the, you know, the pro-abortion say, well, we got to pay for these abortions so these women can can get their lives together and get you know rich and everything. Well, how much has their life changed in a year? Not much. We They've just been traumatized, and now they yeah. now they get pregnant again. And some of them will go through repeat abortions, as a cycle of repeat abortions. Others will finally bring their children to term, and now they're uh, living with the trauma of a past abortion, having more difficulty parenting because of that. Maybe more difficulty getting married because they have all these unresolved emotional issues. And who wants to you know marry a woman who's blowing up all the time because she's got unresolved issues with the past abortion. So it's very difficult. It you know, impacts all aspects of your life. So one of our studies found that uh, it impacts the raising of, of other children. Uh, that a national s survey done by the federal government, we analyzed the data and found that women who had abortions, that their children had more behavioral problems and a less supportive home environments because the, the women were having harder time being the good mothers they want to be for th their children. And it impacts those children acting out. As you know, there's so many ways it impacts children. Some can be generational abortions where girls will have an abortion because their mother had one, right? And things of, of that nature. So the impact's really uh, profound. It's, it's uh, you know, we can't just, we could go on for hours describing that right we here. We did, but. in Forbidden Grief. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but, we uh, wrote about all these problems and yeah. more, the link between abortion and eating disorders. And the other thing I think is important to mention is the link between a previous sexual abuse and a woman's history, making her vulnerable to even experiencing abortion. Um, if the gift of her sexuality has been denigrated or manipulated and um, not respected as the gift that it is, she goes on to live a promiscuous life. This puts her at high risk, and these are the women who end up on abortion right. tables and it's just yeah. important to remember that because a lot of people have a troubling history beforehand where the abortion experience itself will make it even worse it's almost a reenactment right. of the previous trauma well, I like to tell uh, when I, a few times I speak to high school groups the kids especially to the boys and the girls both if you, you don't understand you know what a person's been through as you mentioned a sexual assault as, as a teenage girl young girl or even pre Adolescent, Preteen, yeah. It's so damaging, and these young girls are set up for, I mean, it's so hard to break free from the path of eventually getting pregnant and having an abortion because they're, A, sexual boundaries are violated. They think they have to, they, they want to break free from a sexual, the abuse that they're experiencing, so they want to get married and have children in a way, and they're looking for a place to have a loving child. But they've also learned from experience that you give in to what others demand. And so when they're demanding the abortion, her response is to give in to those pressures again. Yeah, and there's it, been such a violation of boundaries that they don't know how to set them for themselves to protect right. themselves for what is good right. and nurturing for them as women. And that's uh, what, what I try to tell the teens is to have a lot more compassion and understanding t towards the young, the girl who's got the bad reputation, who maybe had an abortion or whatever. You don't know what she has suffered that led to all those things. That's right. And for a young man, I'd say especially the young man who's tempted to take advantage while she's available, you know, and I want to explore my sexuality and whatever, you're just damaging her more. If you see beyond the fact that she is needy and she's willing to, to use her body to try to get affirmation that I'm a good person, if you take advantage of that, you're just another abuser. That's and right. if, the, if young men understand that, I think it will help to guard their purity when they're faced with a temptation because the, the temptress, so to speak, she doesn't know how else to act. She's just lear That's yearning she's for acceptance and love. She's just, you know, she just wants true love, mm -hmm. but she doesn't know how to get it other than to be, you know, act on how she's been shaped by others to be sexualized. So, you know, I think that's uh, something I try to tell young men. Uh, one of the, here's a little poem that uh, Vince Rue 
had, I think is important, is from somebody else, from a young man. But I think it applies to both the women and men. Uh, I, I call it who I want to be. I wasn't in the room. I wasn't e even in the clinic that day. But in my mind, I've been there a million times since. I've been there watching, breaking, wanting to rescue you. In my mind, I need to be a hero, not a killer. The man who didn't flee, but I'm not. I am the man I fear to see. I'm the man I fear to see. And I think that underscores a lot of what abortion is. It exposes deeply our own weaknesses, our failures, how we miss the chance to be the person we want to be because we got involved in this abortion. And so that is a real challenge to a person's self-identity and self-esteem and seeing who they are. And so that's where, again, that's this whole healing thing has to touch that shame and help draw them out of it and basically say, none of us are the persons we wanted to be because we've all made sin and had fault and we need to help. It takes so up. much courage and humility to be able to face that kind of despair and the failures as a, as a human being, not being able to do what you might have wanted or what was right. Uh, a lot of humility. Some people don't get to that place where they can even reach out and they despair and commit suicide. You've done some outstanding research in this area. Can you share with us what you've come up with between the link between suicide and abortion? Well, yeah, there's, uh, there's a number of studies showing higher rates of suicide after abortion. Uh, we've done a few, but uh, some good studies from Finland and uh, Britain. In uh, uh, Finland, they, f they found a, uh, I believe it was like a five and a half fold increased risk of suicide in the first year following an abortion. In our study in California, we saw that increased risk persisted over uh, eight years. Uh, the, there's also increased risk of death from accidents, which could be suicidal behavior, could be just risk-taking behavior because they don't care if they survive. You've talked about women, and women driving, driving the car fast. Reckless, <laughs> reckless, they just get angry. There's some big, Overdosing. Yeah, there's all kinds of ways in which uh, it can be. Even being in abusive relationships where men who will act out the punishment that you feel you deserve because right. you've committed this horrible sin. As you know, a lot of counselors, how come women stay in abusive relationships? Because they, in, in many of these cases, they feel they deserve punishment. They and don't feel worthy of a right. good man. And, and some of them may be somewhat suicidal, and they may even push the buttons because they can't pull the trigger themselves. But if he kills them, what the heck? I mean, we've got a couple of testimonies of women, and literally the man got a knife to their throat, and as they write the testimony, they're saying, you know, I wish he would just do it just because do I don't it. deserve yeah. to live. Right. I killed his, his child. And so, yeah, I mean, the cycle of abuse, how, how it impacts uh, families and, and the suicide uh, rate, it's, it's known that, again, if you look at suicide rates before pregnancy, there's no difference between the women who carry a term and those who have abortions. But afterwards, the suicide rate skyrocket, skyrockets. And that's one reason these, uh, it, when you look at all causes of death, you hear the claim that abortion is safer than childbirth. And, but that's only based on uh, what doctors want to report. But when you look at actually death certificates linked them to abortion, uh, clearly abortion is uh, linked two major studies. The third one is going to be published soon, showing abortions linked with increased risk of death from uh, uh, all causes, from natural causes, from suicide, from accidents. accidents, and even homicide, which again ties back to, the, as you said, the abusive relationship issue. I know a woman that described walking through Central Park in New York City, 3 o'clock in the morning, with dressed up, weird, like almost just asking to be hurt again. And, and we know that people who have been traumatized become victims of other kinds of right. abuse. Um, what about the heart? Um, disease correlation. Oh, that's, that's interesting, yeah. Our, our study of the California one f study found that in probably in the five to eight year range, women had uh, were five times more likely to die of cardiovascular disease. Five times more likely to die of cardiovascular Yes, and uh, we weren't expecting that, but it immediately became obvious that there's lots of research showing that depression and anxiety are associated with heart disease. Stress. Right. Right. So, Abortion causes anxiety and depression. It sure does. Stress, <laughs> and it manifests itself in, in heart disease. And so that's a, uh, if, if we get a, another study to verify that, uh, that's going to be even bigger than the breast cancer, abortion breast cancer link. 
Uh, that doesn't get much number... coverage, though. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> none, none of our studies have gotten much coverage. I have to tell you that. The, uh, uh, they're making a big effort to not <laughs> get into the, to this too much with us. Uh, well, we do know that it's devastating lives, and we do know that women pay a profound price, and the suffering can go on for many, many years. Do you think the pro-life movement's done enough to reach out? Uh, some people in the pro-life movement are, some people are aware of it, but I, in terms of enough, I think, I don't know if we can ever do enough, you know, I kind of think back to uh, Schindler's List, you know, where he, you know, uh, at the end, as the war's coming over and he's seeing the people he did save, he thinks, I could have done more. And I think that's the, the pro-life movement's going to have to take a good hard look at the post-abortion outreach. Uh, we've been a little bit afraid to talk too much about God's mercy following abortion. Because you don't want to condone because it. Because we don't want to make it sound like abortion. It's okay to have an abortion. We don't. Or that God will forgive <clears throat> you and that you're not. Yeah, go have ahead. The abortion and, and get right. God's. We don't want to encourage the sin of presumption. But as you know, there's a lot of that already occurring anyway. That women do go into having abortion. They're going against their conscience. That they think, well, I've sinned before and God will forgive me. And they don't realize what a huge cross is, is going to come thumping down on their back following the abortion. But I think also very importantly, we're at a stage in the in this now where we've got 30 million women or more and that number of men who've been directly involved in abortions and instead of hiding the good news we have to proclaim the good news that God has mercy on you know as sister Faustina re reports Jesus said those who have, have sinned the most have the most claim to my mercy he's there to bring mercy to uh, those who've been involved in no, anything. I mean, abortion, I'm not sure if it, if it is even the biggest. There's lots of other things that yeah. all of us are, are guilty of. And, but we need to be loudly proclaiming God's mercy because Jesus told us to go forth and preach pre uh, conversion, repentance and conversion and mercy. And when we do that, all these things will start falling into place. The conversions will take place. These women will speak out. They'll start taking actions against the uh, uh, abortionists and against the and the politicians, the politics will change. All these things will work to naturally produce an end to abortion. In a certain sense, the end to abortion isn't they're going to be the direct result of what we do, but it's the indirect of us doing what we're supposed to do, which is bringing mercy to those who need it most. And the, the mystery of the cross is that God could use something so evil and disgusting as the crucifixion of his son to redeem the world and God has the power to transform the evil that's plagued our country and the world um, to bring our redemption and th this is happening so clearly in post-abortion ministries in Rachel's Vineyard in Project Rachel in uh, groups that are helping women experience and men experience the mercy and forgiveness of Jesus and transform the lives. Father Mike Mannion had said a quote that when a woman's giving birth to a child that she is the child's physical lifeline to the world and when an abortion has happened he said that the child could become the mother's spiritual lifeline to God and that happens when the woman feels safe enough to come and repent and feels that uh, right. you know we're there for her and she can reach out to us and it's hard to repent unless you're sure of mercy that's right right that's I mean right. if you're afraid if you're afraid of judgment it's hard to repent oh you just withdraw but when, you, when you reverse the dynamic and make clear that that forgiveness is there mercy is there we love you we want you part of our family then it's easy to repent or it's at least easier I mean I, I don't know if it's ever easy but we so we have to lower the threshold of fear the threshold of, of, of blame and remember as you said before as the Holy Father said these women are going to be the most eloquent spokespersons for life well, they speak God. with humility right. and a deep reliance on God and a great compassion because they've been there. Right. And God uses sinners because that's all, the only raw material he has, right? Yeah. That's what he's left with. And he used Paul, who persecuted the Christians, to be the most tireless of the apostles. Yeah. Right? Because he knew that he had blood on his hands. He'd, he'd watched and participated in the martyrdom of, of Stephen. We thank God and, for his forgiveness. We're yes. out of time now. Okay. <laughs> but thank you for uh, sharing your insights. We'd like to thank you for joining us here at EWTN. And join us in our next series of Making Abortion Rare. when we're going to talk about the politics. You can also find out more about this by logging on to makingabortionrare.com. And there's free information there for you.
Hello and welcome to Making Abortion Rare. In this series, we're discussing Dr. David Reardon's three-pronged strategy for ending abortion, and not only to make abortion illegal, but to make it unthinkable. I'm Dr. Teresa Burke, and I'm the founding director of Rachel's Vineyard Ministries, which provides weekend retreats and support groups for healing after abortion for anyone who's been touched by that. And with me is my friend and colleague, Dr. David Reardon. David is the founding director of the Elliott Institute. He's been involved in post-abortion research and education for the last 20 years. Hello, David. Hi, Teresa. In our series, we've been examining your strategy, and the core ideas underlying your strategy are really based on a very deep understanding of how abortion is hurting women and men and their families. Um, we've looked in past issues about how we can hold abortionists more responsible, about how important it is to uh, protect women from this pain and promote programs of post-abortion healing. Um, in the next segment, we're going to be looking at your third prong of your strategy, which is how an awareness of abortion's dangers can lead to more um, political strategies that will help um, safeguard women from the dangers. So right. you've argued in the past that the fastest way to end abortion is to simply require that abortionists act like doctors. What do you mean by that? <laughs> I mean that uh, abortionists are basically medical prostitutes right now. Okay, they are using their medical uh, skills. Medical prostitutes? Yes, they're prostituting their skills. They're using their skill, but they're not using it ethically and not within uh, the normal ethics of medicine. Let me give you an example of, of, of this. Imagine that, that you had a lump in your breast, and you went to your doctor and said, I have, a, I have a, a, a lump in my breast, I need a mastectomy, and he said, jump up on the table and I'll take it right off. Is that medicine, or is that malpractice? <laughs> malpractice. <laughs> I mean, I'd want a second opinion. <laughs> but, but see, the, you know, there's no second opinion. The, the doctor's taking it. He's just honoring your choice. You wanted to have the mastectomy. He's just doing what you wanted. See, that's the mindset of the abortionist is, she wanted it, I'm going to do it. He's not making it, he's not d determining whether or not uh, a mastectomy would, is really needed or whether or not a mastectomy is, is even if you have bre breast cancer. He doesn't even know you have, you have breast cancer, but he doesn't even know maybe uh, some other method of treatment is, is better. Maybe it's contra a mastectomy is contraindicated. But he's not making a medical judgment. He's simply doing what you want. And that's why I call it a prostitution of, of medical skills. He's just come, if you've got the money, I'll do the abortion. For uh, the asking. Right, Kevin Sherlock, who is the author of uh, Victims of uh, Choice, who's masterful, he's researched all the information about the uh, abortion-related deaths, looking at original records and co complications and things. Uh, but he says that uh, the only difference between uh, uh, abortion is still practiced with the ethics of the back alley. And I think that's true. The, the ethics are the same. If you've got the money, I'll do the abortion. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. In the uh, uh, Supreme Court, in the Roe v. Wade decision, uh, said that basic responsibility for the abortion decision is with the physician. The Supreme Court specifically rejected the argument that women have an absolute right to abortion. They said that, uh, in essence, because it has medical co complications associated with it, it's the duty of the physician to make the final de 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 determination of whether or not it's going to be beneficial to women. And so if we can hold abortionists accountable, that changes everything. My book, Make Abortion Rare, was I took the title kind of facetiously, I tend to do this, from uh, uh, Bill Clinton's statement about that he wanted to see abortion safe, legal, and rare. I remember and, that. Yeah. And yeah, I thought it was an ingenious statement because it touches the pulse of the American people who want to see abortion rare. But of course, from my viewpoint, you can make it legal, but you can't legalize and require it to be safe, right? So th that's where his, dico you know, his dichotomy is that legal and safe, that doesn't go together. He wants people to think it goes together. But if you want to make abortion rare, you got to make it, just make sure that abortions only perform safe abortions. And it's not safe just because <laughs> it's legal. We know that. Right. So, so since it's never safe, you want to make abortion really rare, hold abortions accountable for all the injuries, that, f physical and psychological injuries that result from abortion. And they'll stop doing abortions. But given the Supreme Court's decision on abortion, isn't it abortion different than other forms of medical treatment? Um, because it's classified as a woman's choice. So why would the doctor be held responsible for making sure that her choice is a good one? Well, first off, because that's his job. 
he is, has a fiduciary responsibility to his client to first do no harm, okay, that's basic medical ethics, and to basically give good advice. See, the woman who thinks she needs an abortion, or as we talked about before, is being pressured by other people to have an abortion, okay, she's going there assuming the abortion is going to solve her problems, okay. Um, a quick example, one woman who she became pregnant uh, by another man following a divorce previously. She has a couple other children. She's all excited about having the baby. They're setting a wedding date and all this stuff. But suddenly she gets a fear in her heart that if I have this baby, my ex-husband may try to get custody of my other two children. Later, it turns out, he told her he mm. wanted to have. But she's got this fear in her heart. So she goes and gets an abortion. Just now, out of fear. Just out of fear. Now, a, any counselor who really cared about that woman would find out, well, you really want to have this baby? Oh, yeah, we really wish we could, but I'm just afraid of my husband. They shouldn't be getting abortion. She should be getting some legal counsel. Right. <laughs> right? Right. You're uh, treating the wrong problem. Exactly. And so, you know, whether it's because, well, I'm afraid my parents are going to throw me out. Well, maybe you need some other social support. Whatever the reasons are, they should be looking for a, the, a method of helping that woman that exposes her to the least risk. And as I said, the Supreme Court actually said, Basic responsibility rests with the physician. So on this matter alone, at least, we want to uphold Roe v. Wade. We want to encourage that if Roe is going to be the law of the land, let's make these doctors responsible for making good medical recommendation. And they can't do that unless they screen for risk factors and they try to do a cost-benefit analysis of whether or not this woman is more likely to be benefited or hurt. And they always say that the abortion is a carefully thought out decision between a woman and her physician privately together that they go through this big discussion but I know from counseling women that the very first and last time that they even meet their doctor is when their legs are strapped up in stirrups and they're about to undergo the, an abortion. Oh yeah and the counseling process itself when they sit down with the counselor because the, as you said the doctor doesn't counsel them. The counseling process is typically five minutes individual counseling or 15 minutes of group counseling. And a good part of that is about what birth control method are you going to use after the abortion. So it's not about decision making. They, in fact, a lot of the counselors, you know, I go into some length at this in the book, but their philosophy is that they are not to challenge the decision making process, even though they know women are making flawed decision making. You know, so uh, they feel that it will heighten her vulnerability and make her nervous. Well, and who wants to do that? That's a very paternalistic attitude. Well, th another way to look at it is there's a, lots of issues going on. The just from a financial viewpoint. The New York Times published a uh, uh, re report last year about how competitive abortion industry is, especially in the big cities. You know, they're constantly trying to get clients. The, if abortion, the cost of abortion had kept pace with other medical costs from, from 1973 to today, an abortion would, should cost about $2,500. But it's only still in the range of three to four hundred dollars. That's because they do so many. They because they do so many. Because it's an assembly line process, and the reason this is that it can be an assembly line process is they don't do proper screening and counseling. No medical recommendations. It's if you want the abortion, we'll do it. And they, it's fit women into a mold. They all fit in the same mold. And so that's the only medicine that you can just have for the asking. Even prescription. If I wanted to take a sleeping pill tonight, I wouldn't be able to get that just because I asked for it. Well, exactly. I mean, and that's why, in a way, the Supreme Court was saying, no, we're going to reject the idea that women can just get whatever they want because there's some medical risks. See, the woman can't know. She may think she wants to have an abortion. So the law is that a woman may freely go request an abortion. Okay. It's the doctor's duty then to examine the patient, determine if it's going to be to, uh, to her benefit. Then he can make a decision whether to recommend it or not. Okay, at least in theory, abortion is a t tool in his bag of tricks, but it's not supposed to be something he uses every time. So if he decides to recommend it, then he's supposed to tell her about all the risks and alternatives, because now he needs to educate her so she can make an informed choice. Before she's making a, this is what I think I need. You know, right. I think I need a mastectomy. You know, I think I need an abortion. Well, let's slow down here. Let's look at the situation. Here's why I recommend, and here's why, and here's the risk, here, here's this. And so then the woman should be fully informed so she can decide then to refuse the recommendation and not have the abortion if he's recommending it or whatever. But if you did proper screening for risk factors, even on the psychological side especially, there's over 30-some studies identifying risk factors, uh, at least 80% of women having abortions have multiple risk factors. Sure they do. And if you do this proper screening, that changes the whole counseling process. The assembly line grinds to a halt. 
And so that's one of the key aspects of what I've advocated in, in the book about one of the key ways to uh, stop abortions and bring the abor assembly line abortions to a halt is simply to require doctors to screen for risk factors that predict physical and psychological problems after abortion. Inform the woman of those risk factors and make a medical recommendation based on those. So if we could pretend just for a minute to okay. put aside the moral argument of abortion, when would a doctor be able to recommend one based on the best available medical evidence that we have today? That's a good good question and the uh, one of the standards that's really developing in medicine now that's highly promoted is what they call evidence-based medicine which means look at the evidence. If there's research you know showing you know it used to be that women were told to deliver on their back okay which was against Nature. Didn't, against nature, you know, it didn't use gravity, but it was the practice of what doctors did, okay? Right. In the same way, the practice that doctors do now is just assume that abortion makes women's lives better. But there's actually not a single study showing that women benefit from abortion. There's no study showing that they have better relationships, that their psychological health improves, their physical health improves. Even women with, uh, uh, say, breast cancer or, or cervical cancer, the best studies show there that their longevity is, is, is better. If they're pregnant and doctors are encouraging an abortion in those cases, that they're, that they're more likely to survive and beat the cancer if they carry the term. The few studies in there, so all, in every case that you can imagine, there, you know, and this is, again goes back a little bit to making a medical recommendation. Women are seeking abortions for different reasons. Simply to say, well, we think you, you'll survive the abortion. Okay, the odds are, you know, it's kind of like, well, it won't, we don't think it'll hurt but will produce the benefit. The woman who wants the abortion because she's afraid her boyfriend will leave her. What are the odds that the, she's going to keep her boyfriend if she has the abortion? Small. <laughs> Very small. Yeah. Abortion's going to, so if she's not going to get the benefit, the doctor shouldn't be encouraging that as an option. You don't expose her to, at the very least, you should be saying, well, if that's the reason you want the abortion, or for example, say she's being dragged into the abortion by her, her parents. That's a risk factor, coercion being one of the risk factors, or prior psychological illness. They should be doing a psychological evaluation of these women to see if they're at higher risk of depression or suicide. Is abortion going to make this woman's life worse? But if she's being dragged in by her parents or boyfriend, it's really the duty of the doctor to talk to the parents and boyfriend saying, oh, no, don't, don't pressure her to have this abortion. It's against her moral beliefs. She wants to have the baby. You need to be supportive because if you make her have this abortion, let me tell you. This is everything that's going to happen. Yeah, it's going to yeah. put a huge divide in your relationship. She's likely to become suicidal. She's likely to become promiscuous. She's going to live with this trauma the rest of her life. She's, and you're going to have to live with these consequences. They should be discouraging people from coercing, but instead they get on the side of the coercers and say, you know, you're selfish to want to keep this baby. And we so didn't have this good. evidence, though, 30 years ago. In fact, when uh, Norma McCorvey's efforts right now to overturn Roe versus Wade that was made on her name is based on all the research that's come forth and, and her own pain about, about this. Right. But now, 30 years after it's been going on, we have just piles and piles of indicators that this is just bad medicine, it's right. not good for women. And the, the, the Supreme Court, with very little evidence before it, just bought the lie that abortion is safer than childbirth. It bought the lie that it will make women's lives better. And so we failed to make the uh, abortionists really accountable for what the Supreme, Supreme Court just assumed. Blackman was the, um, who wrote the Roe v. Wade and Doe v. Bolton decisions. He was actually a doctor's attorney. He was an attorney for Mayo Clinic. And so his mindset approaching the abortion issue was, if doctors think this is good for women, who is the state to get involved? Okay, we should keep the state out of it. It should be between women and, and their doctors. So he was trusting doctors to be, in fact, even the opinion reads like, uh, I'm dating myself, but, <laughs> but, but, but uh, Dr. Welby saying, you know, family physician who knows you and knows your personal situation and can give you good advice and would guide you to make, you know, the best decision in, in each case. And so he's going to, carefully counsel and guide women. So this whole Like he's your best friend. Exactly. <laughs> right. And so in that model, uh, again, if you look at the best evidence, that family physician... That's the model before HMO. Well, and in a certain sense, you know, I think in the, in the long term, in the future, even when we get a, a human rights amendment, uh, or a life amendment, we want women to be able, in a desperate situation to be able to go to a doctor who cares about them. And if, even if she says, I think I need an abortion, she needs somebody who will say, no, you know, they'll make your life worse and here's the help and whatever. He needs some support. So he should be, he does have a role in counseling the woman. But if he's following, doing, 
is pledged to do no harm and to give good advice, he should be helping the woman avoid the abortion because it has far more physical and psychological risks and no known benefits. And that's why, again, when they can they recommend it? Never. Because in terms of a cost-benefit analysis, you have no proven benefits, all kinds of risks. So you have no basis for recommending an abortion. And if we hold them liable, and again, I go in a lot of detail in the book about you know, model legislation, that how, how we can do this uh, in a very pro-woman way. Well, if the doctors aren't acting like doctors, how can we make it easier for women to be protected and hold um, physicians accountable for the injuries that they suffer and protect women from coerced, unwanted, and dangerous abortions? I think the key is, again, to remember that in a certain sense, Again, we were saying before, the most effective pro-life legislation in this case doesn't have to have anything to do with talking about the baby. It, has to, it, it simply says, basically, that if you're going to do abortions, you have to do abortions at the highest standard of care with proper screening and counseling, and you'll be liable if you, if you don't. And one of the ways to do that, see, milk and malpractice laws in most states are a little bit tilted towards protecting the doctor. Okay, and if the states, if the Supreme Court and other courts aren't going to allow the state to directly regulate abortion, basically we can take the position, well, if we can't regulate abortion, we're going to let women regulate abortion by making it easier for them to hold the abortion as accountable. So, for example, screening risk factors, if you put into this, the law what the standard of care is, by that I mean when a, do, a, a lawyer sues a doctor, in any case, he has to uh, bring in experts to prove, well, what is the standard of care? How, what should have happened there? Uh, in order to then prove that it didn't happen and then you can hold them accountable. So if we put into the standard of care that you have to do screening for these risk factors, and if for every case where you don't screen for a known risk factor, uh, it's a $10,000 immediate award. That itself is an injury. Plus you can get any awards damages for any other injuries, plus you get attorney's fees. Now you turn this into a cookie cutter case for the malpractice attorney. If they don't do proper screening, Get he gets, you can get a summary judgment from the judge. You don't even have to have a trial. You just show they didn't do the screening. And this, it says, it says in the statute, you have to do screening, so you don't have to bring in other experts. And so that changes things. And another big factor would be extending the statute of limitations. Because women, as you all know, are so filled with shame after an abortion. They can't talk about it. They don't want to go. They couldn't prosecute or go through depositions sure. and everything else. So by extending the statute of limitations so women can sue after they recovered from psychological injury, now the abortionists are at risk that women will come 15 years down the road who've been through substance abuse, suicide, uh, infertility, and all these problems. Right now, they're off the hook. Two years after the abortion, they're off the hook. And there's, there's no recourse for them. It's like rape. It's over. It's like emotional. Mm -hmm. It's physical and emotional rape. The woman is so traumatized, only half of rape, rapes get reported That's right. because the women can't talk about it. So the abortionists are able to traumatize women badly enough that they very rarely They're get silent. sued. Even women with very severe physical injuries. We've had it, attorneys who are prosecuting the cases and the women disappear after a deposition or two. They're just so emotionally fragile. They can't Go proceed. Through that. It's proceed. very stressful to take any yeah. kind of a... But, the, but as you, women who've been through Project Rachel and matured for a few more years, that's a, that's a lot different plaintiff, isn't it? Yes, it sure is. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and she wants to fight, but right. there's a long time before you have the energy to fight or even feel that you have the right to fight right. because you did this to yourself, right. and uh, there's the self-blame that goes along with that. You know, you've been writing about these risk factors for as long as I can remember, <laughs> and even poor choice advocates have identified them, and they publish journals, even if they call it small numbers of women that are impacted. Um, how come abortion clinics aren't screening for these? Why isn't that happening? Probably the biggest reason is because they can get away with it. <laughs> they, because first off, if they did, as I said, if, if they had to do screening, you can't do that in five minutes or 15 minute counseling sessions, so the assembly line would grind to a halt. So the only way to be efficient and still offer $300 abortions is to cut out back screening. So it, they, they don't want to because it only would put them at higher risk of losing patients. If they have to document what the risk factors are, that puts them at higher risk of getting sued if they go ahead and do the abortion anyway. But one of the big factors is that it's the law in general does not allow you to recover for psychological injury unless there's also physical injury. So a key aspect of, of this legislation is to make it, uh, is to recognize that proof of, that you know, there's clear medical evidence that abortion can cause psychological injury and allow women to recover for pure psychological injury. And uh, that would, like I said, that would, that would break the back of the abortion industry. Very quickly, I would think, if yeah. women could do that. 
uh, you know, it's, I'm convinced our model legislation that if uh, it were passed, uh, the abortion mills, the assembly lines would shut down. There may be individual physicians who might try it for a while, but the assembly lines, they simply cannot operate in an environment where they have to do individualized counseling, uh, careful screening, and be accountable for the injuries. They, they can get by with, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quantity business where they have, you know, a low margin, they make, you know, moderate profit off of a whole bunch of abortions done real quickly, assembly line fashion, and it will totally throw off the, their whole economic framework if they had to do screening and were held liable. So your proposal doesn't actually um, put a ban on any abortions, but it's very pro-woman because it's concerned and focused on protecting women's health. Yeah, well, it puts the other side in the position of arguing. On the defensive, like we've <laughs> well, been. <laughs> well, to argue, I mean, how are you going to argue that doctors should be able to do abortions without screening for risk factors? <laughs> you can't. <laughs> you know, every every you can't. other medical procedure we, we have screening and it's a normal thing and it makes sense and, and in a certain sense you know I'd like to see our lobbyists go in with uh, buttons that say women first women before the abortionists women's health is more important than the abortionists uh, well-being in fact we should be you know politically setting it up at that that we're the ones defending a, a women's rights and the only pe people who can be against this are those who are more concerned about the abortion industry's profits than they are about women has the legislation been passed anywhere? We've had a, a small element of it just passed recently in Missouri where they uh, put into their informed consent statute a requirement that uh, they screen for the risk factors. They haven't done a lot of the other things that we're doing. So I'm anxious to see how that might uh, be implemented. Uh, and other than that, we've got a few other states that are looking at trying to bring it forward. But there's a certain amount of, if it hasn't passed in one state, other groups are hesitant to, you know, once we get passed in one state, I think it will it'll go really on. go, but we need to get the model bill passed in a single state. Yeah. How does holding abortionists more liable for the injuries that women suffer uh, interact with post-abortion healing outreach? I think, that, well, for, in several ways. One, one is that well, post-abortion outreach needs to be done in and of itself. I mean, it's simply the right charitable thing to bring mercy and healing to these women. But as they're healed, it gives them an avenue in which to protect other women. The woman who has the right motives to bring in the lawsuit isn't necessarily concerned about financial compensation for herself as I've got to protect other women who are going through the same thing. So as more and more women find healing, the, 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 there's a greater exposure to, the, to uh, liability. So there's going to be greater risk of uh, abortions being sued. So, David, how would this legislation impact abortion in hard cases? That would be rape, incest and women who've been told that their child has a fetal abnormality. They have the same impact. I think that's one of the advantages. It addresses those things because as you know, rape, incest, and fetal abnormality are actually more contraindications. Women who have abortions in those cases have more trauma uh, and very likely they're going to have trauma. We have a book called Victims and Victors that looks at uh, 150, 190 women who had rape or incest pregnancies. And the testimony from those women is very clear that those who had abortions, the abortion exaggerated the trauma, increased the trauma, it was harder to get over than the rape or incest. And those who carried a term say that was the way to go, that was the more healing path. It was difficult, they needed support. But if, you know, one of our goals actually, we have a little petition from some of these women who want asking congressional, for congressional hearings that if they ever, uh, instead of funding abortions for rape and incest, listen to them because they will convince the public that abortion is not a solution in those cases. And so this legislation protects these women from abortion also. Well, I want to thank you for sharing your expertise and your knowledge on this subject. And I want to thank you, our viewing audience, for joining us here at EWTN. You can check out more about Making Abortion Rare at makingabortionrare.com. And you can also look up programs for healing at Rachel's Vineyard. Hello and welcome to Making Abortion Rare. In this series, we're exploring a three-part strategy for not only making abortion illegal, but for making it unthinkable. Our series is based on Dr. David Reardon's book, Making Abortion Rare. He's written many books on post-abortion, including Abort at Women's Silent No More, and Victims and Victors, and just a countless array of other publications. So it's great to be with you and partake of your wisdom. Glad to be here again. 
We've been examining your three-pronged strategy for ending abortion, and in today's issue, we're going to look at why and how an understanding of post-abortion issues is essential to unraveling the political controversy on abortion. And obviously, abortions really divided our country in terms of the politics, people's personal beliefs. And today there are more than 30 million men and women and families that have all been touched by abortion. And this has changed so dramatically since Roe versus Wade was first legalized. How has the fact that so many people have had abortions changed the political landscape? Well, I think back in the early 70s, you were addressing people on a ideological level about abortion, whether it was right or wrong. Today we're talking to at least a quarter of the voters have had abortions themselves. And you have to address their needs, their concerns, their issues with their own abortions, which are usually unresolved. So they've got a lot of issues about a past abortion. And so you have to understand their mentality, understand their needs and concerns. And I think it helps you to understand, if you look at this, that uh, they would be glad to see abortion go away as long as it's done in a way that helps women. And so we need to start addressing it and educating the public about how the things that we're advocating are pro-woman and helping women and that, uh, again, we're not the enemies of those who've had abortions, but we're really trying to help them. What would be the most important thing that a politician or any pro-life spokesperson should understand when they're addressing an audience that includes post-abortive men and women? In a certain sense, it's the same as any basic fundamental human need, which is we all want to be loved and accepted, right? Right. <laughs> and and, and if, if the politician is acting as if they don't love and accept you, you're not going to cast a vote for them. And so the, for the post of woman and man who has an abortion issue in the past, and the abortion issue comes up in a debate, they're using the gauge as to, is this person, if they knew me personally, would they accept and love me? They're using that response about abortion as a barometer Right or wrong, you don't have, you know, I'm, we're not going to say that this is the right way to judge candidates, of course, but that's how they're going to react. They have an emotional issue attached to their abortion, and so a uh, candidate's position on abortion is touching a very emotional, personal part of their lives. And if it's mishandled, you're pushing that voter away. Yeah, we've talked in previous episodes about how research and other polls show that a lot of women are choosing abortion in violation of their own maternal instincts, their own conscience. Uh, a lot of women will describe it as murder, and um, four out of five women will report feelings of guilt. Well, even Kate Michaelman, who is the head of the National Abortion Rights Action League, which is now uh, pro poor choice America, uh, <laughs> uh, she has said abortion's a bad thing. She's quoted, you know, she felt embarrassed about it, but she sees an abortion bad thing, and, and her own personal story is really intriguing. That, she, see, she was a Catholic, or raised a Catholic, and she was married and had, I, I think, two daughters, and was pregnant when her husband abandoned her, okay? So now she is on welfare, deeply ashamed about the financial condition she's in, all of the d stressful situations of being abandoned with two children and pregnant. The rejection of her rejection. husband. Rejection. She feels she has to have an abortion. And this abortion was just legalized or in New York, but she had to have a, go through a, psych, a psychiatric panel where they had to approve, and so she had to go in and say, I'm suicidal. So she felt that was humiliating. So the whole thing... She had to get the permission of her husband, too, I think, in order to be. have the abortion. Yeah, the whole thing was just humiliating and devastating and against her fundamental moral beliefs, but she felt she had no choice. It's another example of where, in a way, she was aborting primarily because she felt she needed to in order to support her other two children. She saw it as a necessary evil. She thought, the only way I can take care of my other two children is I can't have another. Yeah. And so, in a way, you know, we should have a lot of empathy for the, the situation she was in, the pressure she was in, and she thought abortion was the solution. The psychiatrist said, oh yeah, this will be her solution. And so she went through the, through the abortion and felt the sh typical shame, everything we talk about. But then, in 1973, she describes she was going down the road and she heard that the Supreme Court had legalized abortion. And she says, to quote from a, a speech, she says, I was quite overcome. It felt somehow like a benediction, a retroactive reprieve that helped restore my sense of worth and my integrity. And she described Roe v. Wade as the promise that emerged from darkness to light, from despair to hope. An affirmation of her choice that she needed for this, her guilt. Oh, and just the word benediction. Talk about yeah. a, Fro a Freudian thing. She sees in the Supreme Court saying abortion is socially accepted. 
the blessing that was deprived to her by, from the church because she knew the church condemned abortion. That's right. And so suddenly she feels reintegrated into society. She feels, my abortion wasn't so bad. They understand. They accept me. Oh, and so she's fighting right now. And I think in a very uh, clear sense, it's her fight is less about abortion than it is about protecting the, the blessing she received from the Supreme Court. Protecting reason, her from feeling she's guilt. She's saying, don't take away Roe yeah. v. Wade, because if you take away Roe v. Wade, then you're reimposing, you're, re, you're casting me out, you're treating me like an outcast. You're casting me out of society. Whereas Roe v. Wade said I was part of society and I'm accepted and what I did was okay. That's what she wants. So even Kate Michaelman fundamentally wants acceptance. And so we need to find a way to address that in a, in a positive light which doesn't accept abortion, but accepts the person. We do want acceptance, and because of unresolved feelings of guilt and shame and grief, it leads people to feel judged when you even bring up the subject of abortion. And many are very quick to sense real or imagined criticism and a sense of you rejecting them because exactly. they've embraced abortion. Right. I think that, you know, the assumption of the person who's had an abortion well, I'll give you a little example, I guess. I think the reactions are kind of on a spectrum. They begin with first a sense that whenever we do anything wrong, not just abortion, but just think of any time we have a sin, we have a sense of, of shame, okay? And then self-blame that we put ourselves in the situation of sin. And then defensiveness that other people are going to discover our sin and point fingers at us. So when a politician talks about abortion, he immediately brings up a whole bag of worms that makes them reluctant to talk about it. Right. How do you suggest that they should talk about it? Well, the, the, the worst, I th think the thing that politicians have to understand is that the underlying issue then is shame. And that's what's important for the, for the in fact, again, polls and we have evidence that the people who've had abortions uh, aren't necessarily interested in seeing pro-abortion Supreme Court judges appointed or public funding of abortion, they're not motivated by pro-abortion politics. But they believe, they assume that the pro-choice politician who says, I'm on your side, uh, he accepts me. He's not going to throw stones at me. And if he doesn't accept you, he won't get your vote. Right. If they perceive him as um, right. against them. Well, see, see the, let's use the example of the Bush-Gore uh, campaign. That's a good example. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one. And it's one where believe, I, I honestly believe, and I tried to convey this stuff to, to uh, President Bush before the election, I don't think there would have been the Florida recount if he had addressed post-abortive issues. Because look, 25% of, of women and men voters have been involved in abortion. If pro-life politicians address them the right way, easily a 5% switch, if not 10% sw switch in votes. But anyway, Bush's approach to the abortion issue, and I wrote him right after this interview with Barbara Walters. They asked, she asked, what's your position on abortion? His response was, I'm pro-life. Silence. He didn't want to get into it too much. He was willing to say, I'm pro-life, to let pro-lifers know you can vote for me. But he didn't want to open that can of worms. And you think that was a huge mistake. Oh, well, don't you, don't you? Because yeah. the, because the, po the post-abortive woman assumes, and well, Gore, for, for his camp, they knew that Bush was doing real well with women voters. So what they begin to do? Start harping on abortion issue. Because, they, again, I'm not sure even they understand, but when they say, I'm pro-choice, the implication is, and he's against you. That's right. I'm for you, he's against you. And so the worst thing to do is not to say, I'm for women. What Bush should have said is, I'm pro-life. And I'm also deeply concerned about women who've had abortions. I share their anger, those who've been forced into unwanted abortions. I share their pain when they've been lied to at the clinics. For those who, who need help, I support post-abortion programs, and I want to see more of those things grow. I want to pass laws that will require doctors to provide the highest standards of care and screening. But basically, to move into, I care about women. Because the assumption is, if you're not saying anything toward, for me, you're not for me. If you address all those issues, though, that would resonate so deeply with women to feel that you understand why I felt I had to choose that. You understand that there was coercion and manipulation and um, the circumstances beyond my control that made me feel pressure. And to be able to respond to that is so different 
Like oh, yeah. you said, then just oh, talk about world. how newsworthy it is too. You yeah. know, it, it, you shift out from being you know, al to allow this polarization between I'm for uh, I'm pro-life and I'm pro-choice. If that defines it, people are going to move towards their comfort zone, which is well, at least he's not blaming me. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. They assume that the pro-life politician again, part of it's because of the press, part of it's because of the mistakes we've made, but th they assume that he's judgmental. He'd throw stones at me. If he knew my sins, he'd throw stones. They'd be quite happy to support, uh, in fact, we have poll information, they'd be quite happy to support a pro-life politician who's working to, to reduce abortion rates and even end abortion in ways to protect women. As long, but you have to show that you care about me, that you're not going to throw stones at me. Because as long as they think you're going to throw stones, they're going to back off and be disinclined to vote for somebody who, if they knew me personally, wouldn't like me, right? Uh, so it's, a lot of it's about acceptance, and if you, you mentioned, you may, may have been thinking, well, you mentioned earlier in private conversations, we were talking about a powerful thing, about how powerful this is for women. To be even more powerful is for a, a male politician to go up there and say, and I'm deeply sorry for the men who've abandoned women and not lived up to their obligations to be supportive of them in times of, of pregnancy. That would mean the world to women who've been abandoned by men just to have an apology, a recognition that it's not all their fault because right. so many times women carry the shame and the grief of it by themselves and it just feels like they're all alone. It's their thing. It's of course, their abortion. men feel a lot more than people realize, but certainly for the women assume they're carrying it by themselves. Men assume they're carrying it, but they have to be strong and quiet and not make women feel worse by admitting that they feel bad. So, but it's, it's, it's a, both genders are facing this problem. But to be quiet about it is the worst mistake for a po politician to make is to decide to avoid addressing it. It's actually quite powerful. If you want to sh reverse the gender gap and turn post of women to primarily voting for the pro-life candidates, you have to address why I'm the pro-woman candidate. I'm on the high ground both for the unborn child and for women. And for protecting and, her from right. unwanted coerced. I, I, I want to I protect, I want to give women better al alternatives so they don't have to have an abortion. I want to protect them from being pressured into unwanted abortions. I want to uh, promote post-abortion healing programs for those who've already had abortions because I'm still on their side whether they have an abortion or not. I still care about them. I want to make a difference in their lives. I want to help them uh, be part thriving members of our community. You've developed a little booklet that helps politicians address these issues in a way that's very pro-woman and that shows that you, he's concerned with what women care about. Right. And kind of outlines this. Yeah. How can people find out about that? Yeah, we have that uh, a, a free PDF copy on our website at makingabortionrare.com. People can download it. And it's something you could give to your politicians. Give it to your pro-life groups so they can circulate to politicians. But we need to... Re to encourage pro-life politicians that pro-lifers accept and will support this. These politicians may be afraid, well, if I talk about I'm pro-woman, I'm pro will the pro-lifers think I'm abandoning them? No, we want you to be pro-life and pro-woman. I like to borrow from the Holy Father's analogy of, you know, the church from the East and the West, that we have to breathe with two lungs, one for the woman, one for the child. Okay, it's not about abandoning one or the other, it's about being on the side of both. And we need to articulate that so the public understands, so women understand, that just because we are pro-life doesn't mean we don't care about them. We deep, care deeply about them. We, we need to show we care more deeply about women before an abortion than the pro-abortionists. We care more about women after abortion than the pro-abortionists. We are there before and after. We try to help them avoid making the terrible mistake of an abortion. And even if they do, we're still there to help pick up the pieces. And you're advocating a complete reframing of the political debate around abortion. Yeah, I, basically the part of it is we have to fight the way it was framed early on as the a choice between the rights of the baby or the rights of the woman. If you allow it to be framed that way, that suggests that it's, you can choose sides. Uh -huh. What we need to frame it as, no, the intertwining of the woman's and the child's welfare is intertwined by God. We're on the right sides of both. To help one, we help the other. To protect one, we have to protect both. And so making clear that, in a certain sense, our reframing of it is, this is about the welfare of women and their children versus uh, those who had pressured them into unwanted abortions versus uh, abortion profiteers in the abortion industry, versus the population controllers who don't care if women are hurt as long as they're suppressing the population of minorities, for example. 
we make clear that it's women and children who are on their side against all those people who abuse and exploit them to serve their own social uh, ends. And so, that, you know, if we do that, that puts the other side in an awkward position. Oh, it sure does. And you really shift to a more pro-woman perspective when you outline that coercion that goes on. Um, I've seen countless women at Rachel's Vineyard Retreats who are literally pressured by unwanted coerced abortions. Yeah, I think that's what we need to talk about. And one phrase that we should use often is the problem is talk about the problem of unwanted abortions. Everybody talks about unwanted pregnancies and dangerous and, abortions. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's not just un, it's, there, there's not just unwanted pregnancies. There's unwanted abortions. How are we going to help women avoid these unwanted abortions? And we've got to <coughs> protect them from dangerous abortions. We have to protect them. I think this is useful uh, language from unnecessary abortions. We don't think it's ever necessary, but it points out that abortion doesn't produce the good results. David, another part of your strategy that you outlined in making abortion rare is advocating that politicians and the rest of us refer to pro-abortion advocates as poor choice advocates instead of pro-choice. Why is that important? Actually, I, I, that's only a more recent innovation. That's not in the uh, uh, Make Abortion Rare, but uh, we have a website called poorchoice.org that goes into it at some length. But first, the other side has hidden behind the idea of choice. You know, they've avoid, they don't, they don't talk about abortion because they know that word bothers people because too many people have been involved in abortions, but they talk about choice. They've idealized choice as good in, in, in and of itself. But as we know, some choices are good, some choices are bad. So when we talk about poor choice, we're forcing them then to try to defend why abortion's a good choice. If Bush had been saying, well, my poor choice opponent here, <laughs> whatever, well, how's Gore going to respond? He has to then say, well, I'm not for poor choices, you know. But it also the words sound so much like poor choice and pro-choice that if we use it often enough, it becomes connected in people's minds just linguistically so that when they hear pro-choice, they kind of think poor choice. In fact, we even got bumper st stickers that say like, you know, uh, uh, Planned po plan Parenthood, poor choice since 1916, okay? You know, That's or, a good or, one. I like yeah, that. Or, yeah. or, 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 you know, Vote, vote poor choice, vote gore, you know, something like that. You know, so there's ways, you know, we can talk about, you know, poor choice advocates are really, you know, uh, pro-choice advocates are really poor choice. You can imagine like when Senator Edward Kennedy st says something like, I'm poor choice, well, I mean pro-choice. The language is so powerful that the link of these two words, the other side will start letting it slip through. You know, the poor choice is going to emerge as something that will really undermine the rhetoric of choice, which has been a real powerful tool by the pro-abortionists. They spent millions of dollars developing and testing this idea that we need to not talk about uh, women's rights or, or, or abortion, but about choice, choice, choice. And you'll always hear them try to, for, whose choice should it be? That's their big question. And our point is, is it a good choice or is it a poor choice? And that choice has hurt and devastated so many women's lives and impacted their families. And then there's been a very high social cost. Part of your political strategy would include exposing the social price that's been paid. Can, right. you, can you describe about that? Well, well, another avenue, for example, is to have, just as the state sued the tobacco industry to recover for medical uh, costs of treating tobacco problems. We have states that are paying for abortions, and even if they're not paying for abortions, we have people on welfare who after an abortion have a punctured uterus, and the state's picking up the bill. We know abortion increases the risk of breast cancer. Cerebral heart palsy. Disease, cere cerebral palsy. Children, children uh, women who have abortions have uh, double the risk of premature delivery and later d deliveries. And giving uh, th just the hospital stay alone for a premature child is like uh, staggering. $58,000 yeah. compared to, say, 4300 for a normal baby. So the state's paying a huge medical bill for these things. And this is kind of another avenue where the state could try to recover the cost from the abortion industry for these abortion-related complications. And how about requiring abortionists to screen for risk factors to protect women um, from coerced abortions? You've made so many of these suggestions available in your book, um, but how do you recommend that these uh, initiatives be positioned in the political debate? I think it's mainly to point out that this, these initiatives are pro-women, okay? That the goal is to simply make sure that if abortion is going to be done, it's going to be done as safely as possible. And so, the, and for example, who can be in favor of coerced abortions, right? Nobody. <laughs> well, it'd be pretty hard. So, 
for our, us for us to bring forward legislation that requires clinics to protect women from being pressured into online abortions. That would impact directly at least 40% of the abortions right off the top. And of course, the other side is squalling because, you know, well, but we're already doing that or whatever. And of course, then our response is we don't have to prove that they're not already doing screening. It's like if you're, you know, if Planned Parenthood says, well, we're already doing good screening in medical care. Well, we just want to put it in the statute and make sure everybody rises to your same high standard of care. Right? Because right now they're completely unregulated. Oh, yeah. and, and tremendous abuses are going on because nobody's overseeing them. Right. And so, but politically, we can position it then that uh, this is very pro woman. And if the, this legislation, uh, if they're doing a great job as they claim they are already, then this legislation has no impact. It's just going to put it into law and make sure that we don't have any bad clinics coming into the state, okay? But if, you're, if some women are being hurt and are at high risk, some women are being pressured in unwanted abortions, and it helps to save that small percentage of women from having abortions, shouldn't we all be happy, right? And the only reason it's going to have a big impact, the only reason you could be squalling this much, is if you're afraid that abortion's hurting a whole lot of women and that you're going to lose a whole lot of clients. But let's just let the market decide. Put reasonable standards of care into the law, make sure that clinics protect women from uh, dangerous abortions, and if the clinics thrive, well, then apparently abortion's safe. If they all shut down, apparently abortion is dangerous. And so I think, it, you know, again, our positioning isn't to shut down the abortion clinics, but we can have the expectation that if abortion is as dangerous as we think it is, yeah, we, they might shut down. But we're not, you know, trying to deprive women choice. We're trying to make sure that when they exercise their choice, when they go to clinics, when they inquire about abortion, that their, their health is protected. And if that means that a doctor has an obligation to refuse to do a dangerous abortion, that's what he should do. Does this mean more government regulation for abortion clinics? Well, in a way, no, because we're, instead of regulating abortion in the sense of having inspections or loss of license, in fact, one of the key things of our model legislation is it doesn't impose a risk that the doctor will lose his license or go to jail. It's all dependent on civil liability, which means that if the doctor doesn't hurt anybody, no problems. But it makes it easier for the woman to sue the doctor later on. So it's really, you know, they want it to be between the woman and her doctor. We're saying, okay, it's going to be between the woman and her doctor, but we're going to make sure she has adequate recourse to the courts so that, you know, like we said before, she can sue after she's recovered from the psychological injuries instead of only within the first two years. We, basically, we're removing extra protections that the abortionists have so they're exposed to proper liability. So they can't hide behind nuances in the law that cut off the statute of limitations and things of that nature. So it's really about you want it between women and doctors, you don't want the state to regulate, okay, we're going to stop regulating, we're just going to make it easier for women to hold you accountable. And that really has a dramatic impact. Another important part about that is that if it, by taking this approach, we're giving the Supreme Court an easy way. If they get these bills get challenged, you know, which we have some clever things to prevent it from being challenged because because it's between the woman and the doctor, they have no real recourse in the court, in the courts. The doctors can't sue to in, uh, stop the law from being, being applied. But even if it did get uh, brought up to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court's not going to decide that doctors have a right to do dangerous abortions, right? And so we give the Supreme Court an elegant way to back out. They don't have to say Roe v. Wade is wrong, but they can say, no, doctors are, are li ha have to be liable to this protect women. This is so exciting. I hope that it can be implemented, and we're certainly going to pray for that. Thank you for joining us in our series, Making Abortion Rare. And I invite you to check out a whole lot more information on the website, makingabortionrare.com. I also invite you to read the book Forbidden Grief, The Unspoken Pain of Abortion that David and I wrote. And if you're interested in post-abortion ministry, contact Rachel's Vineyard. Hello and welcome to Making Abortion Rare, where we're exploring a strategy to make abortion unthinkable. I'm Dr. Teresa Burke, and I'm the founding director of Rachel's Vineyard Ministries, which provides weekend retreats and support group for healing after abortion. And with me is Dr. David Reardon, the founding director of the Elliott Institute. In this series, we've been examining Dr. Reardon's three-pronged strategy for ending abortion. 
and it's all outlined in his book, Making Abortion Rare. Uh, in our previous episodes, we've talked about how abortion hurts women. We've talked about the need to promote post-abortion programs for healing and reconciliation. And we've also discussed how women can make abortionists more accountable for the injuries that they suffer. And today we're going to wrap it all up and talk about how we can implement the plan, what we can do as individuals and as a church to see that some of these things can become a reality. Right. There's all kinds of different areas for people to be involved. You know, everybody's going to have different interests, different talents, uh, as we talked about previously. Uh, just learning better ways to uh, talk among groups of people about abortion in a way that uh, opens the path to healing. We'll talk a little bit about that. But also, uh, for, in terms of political activity and supporting research and education efforts, there's lots of things. And we're just going to kind of, between the two of us, brainstorm about some of the things that can be done. And a lot of it's kind of outlined in the book. Uh, but I think you know, the first place to begin, perhaps, is get it out of the way. It's the thing that people are fixated on a little bit in abortion is the politics of it. You know, what politically are we supposed to do? And that's very important. Um, I think it's, and actually, in terms of the litigation and the shortcut to ending abortion is through liability. But to make abortion unthinkable, we have to bring healing to those who've already had abortions, to free them to talk about their experience so that their story of been there, done that, hated it, becomes part of our culture. And you can't really speak out against abortion unless there has been healing in your life. Right. That's just a natural outgrowth of it. It's not an agenda of it, certainly. Right. Oh, no. But that's something that women want because when they reckon with their own pain, they want to save other women right. from going through that same thing. I think e even if this wasn't going to lead to an end to abortion, it, it's the right thing to do. We, we are supposed to be, we're called by Christ to be ministers of his mercy and forgiveness. We're, we've been recipients of that gift. And part of the obligation is now we have to share that gift with others. And, so, and this is a crying need in our country of millions of people who've been involved in abortion and all the shame and trauma associated with that. It's a huge spiritual need. And it's the right thing to do in and of itself is bring healing. Uh, but it's also appropriate to recognize that by doing what Jesus told us to do, he will give us victory over the culture. You know, we talk about the need for a spiritual renewal in our country. This is one of the seedbeds in which that spiritual renewal is going to come because as we, we were just talking earlier, these women and men who go through this conversion experience and the healing following an abortion, when you feel God's mercy and grace and healing just trent in, you in want Rachel's to proclaim vineyard. it. Oh, yeah. I mean, you, you tell me many times, you know, in Rachel's Vineyard, how the, you know, the whole demeanor of women just can radically change, and it's a, it's a miraculous event. Well, it's like the woman at the well, and she's so filled with the grace and the presence and the intimacy of Christ that she wants to go share it right. with everybody. I mean, these people are, are converted, and it's no slip sliding back. They've been, they've hit the bottom of the barrel, and now they're deeply in love with Christ. And so, uh, this is, uh, you know, I'm full of great hope, but we, we should, I was, we're getting into what we want to talk about, I guess, <laughs> instead of... This what. is the exciting part. <laughs> but, but, you know, but the impact of this is as we bring more and more women to healing and we become the platform, you know, as, and as pro-lifers basically telling the rest of society, listen to these women. We let, help them take their, their proper leadership role in being the ones to say, we've been there. And we know the truth, and we want to spare other women um, from making our same mistake. They have something so important to teach us, the, not only about right. the mercy of God, but about right. the oppression of women. And they're going to politically change the landscape. Now, the shortcut, as I said before, is simply liability. So pro-lifers, before we even get the whole uh, country uh, evangelized and converted and healed, which is going to take a long time, of course, but uh, the shortcut is to uh, pass legislation to make the abortionists liable. And, uh, then, How do we do that? Well, we, we have model legislation on our website, which is, you know, you can find it at makingabortionrare.com or afterabortion.org. And uh, I would begin by, uh, for people who are interested in the uh, politics and the legality and lobbying and all of that, uh, well, with all of, all of this, really, they should begin by reading Making Abortion Rare because it's got a lot more details. And it explains a lot of the uh, neat features of model legislation because we barely touched on any, really. But uh, the, then there's the model legislation, there's talking points, there's things that they can download. They need to begin by lobbying the pro-life groups. Pro-life groups, pro-family groups all have to get together on a piece of legislation before legislators will move it forward because they, they want to see that you're united because any sign of disunity 
is their excuse not to do anything. There has been a lot of disunity in the pro-life oh, yeah. movement, and, uh, and that's something we really want to work to reconcile because our efforts can't go forward as long as we're competing with right. each other rather than collaborating. And I think this offers a venue for unity because it's not about, one of the big issues that's divided pro-lifers has been, do we take a step-by-step -step approach and uh, try to ban abortions in this case, but allow abortions in hard cases because the public tends to favor this or that, and, and other groups to say, no, we can't you know, have any uh, uh, compromise. Th this is no compromise legislation. It's about purely about protecting women, and it applies to all kinds of abortions, and, and it has impact on all levels of abortion, and it is, you know, uh, no one has really attacked it. You know, all the groups have, have indicated, you know, uh, uh, that I've talked to have indicated that there's nothing morally wrong with this approach, and so it's something people can get united by. But also we have, uh, have experience in the past in states where we bring it. One group wants to push our model bill, another group, well, but we, that's, we'll do that some other year, let's do this. And so this disunity still is, is uh, holding it back. It's so, like a cog in the wheel. Right, so I guess I, you know, I'd encourage uh, uh, viewers to uh, read the book, look at the legislation, see if you can work, lobby first your own pro-life groups in your state and get united behind uh, this piece of legislation, and then it, you can push it through the state. And as I said before, politically it's easier to push because the opposition is positioned that the only way you can oppose this bill is if you're more concerned about abortion, protecting the abortion industry than protecting women. So that gives, you know, I think we can swing a lot of swing votes in legislatures who, people who may have said that they were, uh, I'm a pro-choice candidate, but would support this bill because it makes sense. And also give them a way to say, I always said I was for women, this bill is for women, and that's why I'm voting for it. would want to oppose it or they would look right. really... You, yes, you give, you give them a good way to vote pro-woman while at the same time helping curtail abortions and uh, protect by protecting women. So uh, building that unity, get the model legislation. Uh, I mentioned before on our website we've got a, a booklet speci especially for politicians called Reversing the Gender Gap uh, and we'll have hard copies people can order but they can just download the free copy there uh, and it gives sound bites and things to help politicians proclaim what we've been talking about, that I care about women and that uh, it's a wonderful resource, right. and it's so detailed out, each point, right. very well thought well, out. It's very small, so that it's easy for a politician to read. They've got a big campaign going, but all, they just need to reprogram themselves with a few sound bites to be able to clarify that I'm on the side of women and position the poor choice, their poor choice opponent as the one who's offering women the, uh, the least instead of the best. Yeah. We think women deserve better. And, so, and what about yeah. the education and research piece? How can folks help move uh, that along? Right, because that's kind of the second area is, you know, just uh, research and education, which I kind of lumped together. But on the research side, not everybody can do research, of course. Uh, but they can support uh, organizations that are doing research. The Elliott Institute, we are doing research, publishing studies in peer-reviewed journals. In fact, uh, in the past year, you've just had one right after the other. Yeah, we kind of had a spurt of them, but we, and uh, we've had uh, eight studies published in about 18-month period, so that, that's, that's good. good. <laughs> Hopefully we'll keep it up a little bit, but uh, supporting the research, but if, if someone ac has academic skills in psychology or medicine or whatever, trying to document uh, the harm abortion does women, uh, writing letters to the editor. These, these studies have not been reported on by the media, uh, but it's an opportunity for people as they educate themselves, get on our email list and learn about these things, write letters to editors saying, you know, abortion causes more deaths among women than childbirth according to these new studies. Why haven't you been reporting this or whatever? The uh, studies are so wonderful because they bring so much legitimacy to what those of us in the field have known, which could be called anecdotal. You know, I've had right. a woman after woman <clears throat> say this, but when you come in and show a huge sample of women that were studied and show how many are at risk for suicide or substance abuse, it just gives so much validity. And that's where the pro-life movement is very grateful to you for all the, the credibility that you bring to the issue that we've been fighting for. Well, of course, the other side dismisses it as not credible, even though it's published <laughs> in peer-reviewed journals. But in a certain sense, you mentioned anecdotal. This is another thing that we need to do is start saying the claimed benefits of abortion are all anecdotal. <laughs> they they <laughs> say that these benefits, you know, all ben abortions help. Well, you're just giving us anecdotes. Let's Show, us the the Show us the research. Show us the research because we are at the point now where the research is more on our side than the other side. 
and we've published enough now and we're gaining a voice and uh, that credibility that we really need to challenge the other side that here's abortion causes all these these injuries and pain and suffering where are your studies that show the benefit show us the, show us the, yeah. the proven benefit and of course they can't because women who may do, deal well with an abortion for a period of time may suddenly have a breakdown 15 years later right that's right and so you can't prove that there's a long-term benefit because uh, we have the evidence that, that you know some of these women will be exposed to problems later on so that uh, so that's kind of the research that in terms of education which is taking the research or taking the testimonies or whatever anyone can do do that right and yeah, they I mean, can educate themselves about the trauma <coughs> of abortion and be able to share that I know that forbidden grief has been a wonderful resource for doing that right uh, yes I could I recommend highly enough for anyone who wants to understand in a certain sense not just understand but it's also part of allow your own heart to be broken by the stories of the women who've had abortions and understand the psychology and all the little twists of the mind that bring out all the past and the trauma and how it affects women in unexpected ways and really have built empathy in your heart so you can then share that empathy because if you don't have go through a little bit of breaking of your own heart for the women it's hard to uh, I mean, to, to express yeah. it, to really feel that, and for them to just know it. And so reading Forbidden Grief... Well, allowing yourself to join in the suffering of their stories. Right. And that's hard. I mean, it's hard to read that kind of thing. But like you said, it's exactly what we need to do so that we can have the deepest compassion. And part of that means confronting our own fears sometimes, our own uneasiness with the subject, or maybe our own grief about it because a sister's had an abortion or a child or somebody that very close to you that you knew about it and maybe didn't do anything so oh. that's all going to be triggered when you get into the pain of it right. it's very different than just hearing statistics right. to live with the personal story to and it's also healing for the post abortive woman or the post abortive man to be understood to, 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 to be understood and also to see oh others are experiencing what I experienced or for the post abortive man to say now I understand why she had the abortion against my will I think that um, idea of I'm not the only one is so critical because so many women feel so isolated and they feel like they're crazy and uh, it is very comforting it's a wonderful thing about support groups and retreats to be in a whole room filled with people who have walked down that road and you're not the only one I think the ending of that isolation is really critical it is it, and there's lots of ways that we can do this education with through flyers we have uh, the resource hope and healing which is our newspaper supplement that's a wonderful wonderful magazine it's like a newspaper well, it's, it's, a news, it's like a tabloid sized newspaper we've had uh, dioceses put it in their uh, newspaper we've had uh, cities or pro-life groups put it into their high, uh, college newspapers or even their community newspapers the secular papers ever oh, yeah. carry they, it? They, they carry it in fact we distributed it uh, during a the project Rachel outreach campaign in uh, Washington in the Washington Post and uh, was through a special grant we were able uh, from our Sunday visitor we were able to put it in uh, the Washington Post and we had reports back that women were taking it into work the next day it went in on a weekend and they were taking the work and saying did you see this and this is exactly the sort of thing we want, we want to see because it lays all kinds of seeds of education it talks about post abortion issues it talks about getting help and it makes people aware a to be sensitive to women and men who are suffering from post abortion problems it kind of gets beyond the politics saying, you know, we don't care which side you are politically, what are we going to do to bring healing to those who are hurting? There's also apologies in there, aren't there? Yeah. Apologies there, from there, men saying, right. Well, there's sorry. a page where it's, it's a, a, an apologies. Women apologizing to the man for having abortion. Men apologizing for abandoning the woman. The fathers apologizing for pushing the abortion. But the, it, as you've pointed out, it's actually a very therapeutic page because it helps people to, Lowers their to defenses. hear what they really desire in their hearts is that that other people would understand what they've been through but it, this this education is extremely important because it leads has a lot of effects people who uh, read this are less likely to have an abortion themselves because now their awareness of oh gosh I don't want to go through what these women have gone through is higher so it helps it's an inoculation against having abortion it also reduces the risk for of people who read it that uh, they will pressure somebody to have an abortion. It also offers those who've already been involved in abortion hope that they can get healing. Oh, there's these resources out here. Now, that doesn't mean these people are going to jump to the phone and call right away. No, they might <laughs> bury it under their matches for two years. The, I know many people that have done that with brochures for healing. and They'll find them in the back of a church or somewhere and they'll 
hold on to it it's, sometimes it's their, for years. Right. It's their but, little bit of hope that they hang on to, but right? the seeds have been planted. Right. And uh, that will continue to, the Lord will continue to knock at their door until right. they have the courage. And sometimes the courage is gained through these efforts where we just open our arms and we say, we understand, we know you've been through right. a hard time. Well, we've heard had women say, you know, that they would see, for example, an ad in the bulletin for uh, Project Rachel and they didn't respond. But when they saw it month after month after month, it was only in the 18th month that they finally decided, well, maybe they're serious. Yeah. Because there's all this suspicion. And also, part of it is, you know, God's grace and, and God's time. But And people have to be in a position where they have some energy. But women are afraid to open up this deep pain unless they think they can get through the healing process, unless they know it's worth it on the other side, unless they really feel comfortable that if I come and tell you about this, whoever you are out there with the post-abortion program, are you going to help me or are you going to make me feel bad? So there's all this comfort zone that has to be, we have to nurture, right? Let's uh, brainstorm ways we can practically get the word out, okay. what each of our viewers can do to okay. help. Uh, well, I, you suggested, I think, uh, well, is people offering, uh, uh, putting brochures for uh, their local pregnancy uh, resource center. The local which, ministries which, putting the brochures. Post -abortion ministry. Most, most uh, pregnancy centers now have um, Post-abortion post abortion counseling programs. Uh, Project Rachel is in uh, most dioceses. Rachel's Vineyard is in how, 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 how many places in the country? Oh, there'll probably be 250 retreats this year. Two, yeah, so there's plenty of opportunities. So uh, educate is just letting people know that these opportunities are out there. I heard someone tell me in Chicago that she found out about the Rachel's Vineyard retreat because someone had left brochures in the tampon section of the grocery store. Right. <laughs> She's not going to get them in church because she doesn't go to church, but here where women have to go. So right. that was another great idea that that people can just take right. those brochures and put them everywhere in the libraries, right. in the uh, tampon section. <laughs> and uh, well, like the. Uh, Hope and healing. You can get, get, get bundles of that are really cheap. You can leave some in the back of the churches, in doctor's offices, in the grocery store, wherever. But it's something where people pick it up. Uh, or uh, in a small city tent of uh, paper of uh, city circulation of, say, 100,000, uh, it only costs maybe about $10,000 to distribute to the entire circulation. That's a small investment for That's the a, amount of people for, we For pro-life groups yeah. to get together and raise that. Uh, and this can all be tied into major outreach campaigns where uh, we've got a what we call Operation Jericho where groups can get together in a city, churches, pregnancy centers, post-abortion ministries and brainstorm and plan and develop a team effort where there's going to be a community awareness time where you do training ahead of time, you prepare groups and you get everybody kind of online so that for a whole month there's media outreach, there's speaking in the churches, there's things that make the whole community aware and sensitive to post-abortion healing. I know that's going on with a lot of church-based ministries that are offering like Rachel's Vineyard. The entire church community is involved because you have the women from the Bible study who make welcome baskets for the women. When they walk in the first night of the retreat, there's a basket there filled with goodies and um, soaps and they write letters to them saying, I've been praying for you. And when a woman receives this kind of support from the community, it's so effective in dismantling her, her shame because if they care about me this much that they bake these goods, that they're here throughout the retreat praying in another chapel for my healing, mm -hmm. that's so powerful. It, one woman had this beautiful quote that I often like to use, is, and I won't give you all the story about leading up to it, but she said, it took the blood of Christ to remove my guilt, but it took the acceptance of others to remove my shame. It does. It took the blood of Christ to remove my guilt and acceptance of others to remove my shame. And in the, even in the Catholic Catechism, uh, it talks about one of the natures of, of, of sacrament of penance. Sacrament of reconciliation is the priest speaking as both uh, man for the community and uh, for God in terms of forgiveness. And as the man for the community, he's saying, first he says from God, you're forgiven. And as the man from the community, he's conveying, you're welcome back to the communion table. You're okay. part of our community. You're part of us. And so when the whole community does the little baskets and does all these little things, the sense of Oh, it's this welcoming. Church welcomes me. It's so welcoming. Yeah. Uh, it says you're not an outcast. We love you, right. and we rejoice that you're coming home. Right. One of the educational things people can do is invite in speakers, a post board of women. And Sydney Massey, who you know, uh, has done this. And she talks when she goes into a church, and she's talking about her experience. Uh, she can spot who's had an, who's had an abortion because they're not look, look, looking at her so much as looking around, saying, "How are people responding to her?" Because they have the secret abortion, and they're wondering. 
if they can accept her, maybe they can accept me. There is a paranoia when yeah. someone speaks about it, and I've heard many women describe they feel like everyone in the church is looking at them. So that, that's where we need to be so sensitive, our response, our love, our welcoming. Right, because the more we feel, the, the more the person anticipates that they're going to be accepted and welcomed, the lower the barrier is to repent. Another right? great idea is giving a weekend retreat, a Rachel's Vineyard retreat to someone you, as a gift. Um, if you know someone that's close to you that you care about who's had an abortion, sign them up w as a gift. You can also offer to go with them as a support person and attend with them if they're too afraid to go make that journey. And right. that kind of support to just say, I'm willing to go with you right. and hold your hand because I want to see that you get over this. And that's really important for husbands and wives. If, if a husband or wife, if their spouse has been involved in a past abortion and is, doesn't really want to deal with it or is afraid to open up these wounds, to be able to say, I'll go with you. Yes. And, yeah. is, and, and as you've told me many times, it has a tremendous impact on their marriages. It really blossoms a sense of trust and openness and, you know, Intimacy, having Intimacy, communication, it, right. it makes a um, world of difference. Uh, another thing that people can do is uh, give the Jericho Plan to uh, to their priests, pastor. to pastors. Yeah. And maybe, especially if a post board of women uh, give it to the pastor saying, you know, we really need to do this. And the Jericho Plan is, uh, was developed, uh, it's just another short book, but it was developed when somebody asked, well, how come priests don't talk about it from the pulpit? How come our pastors in you know, evangelical churches don't talk about it? And it's because of they're afraid of the politics, they're afraid of, also I think anyone who has preached on it, they know there's two general reactions, either what do you know about it? They don't want to offend, they don't want to <laughs> or offend people. people are going to cry because they, ha they know I've got women here who've had abortions, they've talked to me, it's breaking their hearts when I talk about it. But part of the problem is the typical pastor thinks the only way to preach on abortion is a thou shalt not mm -hmm. approach or one that gets into the politics. And wh what we recommend is, you no, know, if you understand the post-abortion mindset, the way to go is to instead of preaching thou shalt not preach, people in our community already have. People in our church who stopped coming already have. People in your family who stopped coming to Thanksgiving dinner have already had abortions. What are we going to do to help them? Now the post birth person who's hearing that in the pew doesn't feel they're being judged. They're being hearing the pastor say, what are we going to do to help people who've had abortions? And then you preach to the pro-lifers saying, do you really understand the pressures that make women feel they have abortion and you read one of these testimonies to help break the hearts. Now the person who has abortion is like, he really does understand. He's not blaming me. And so this, then you, you know, you start building up, here's the things they experience, feeling isolated, feeling judged and all this. And now you're showing, you're connecting with their emotions and they're saying, oh, he really does understand. And that's, then you encourage, well, what are we going to do to, to support a post-abortion outreach, to support post-abortion ministries and you educate. And so this is, lays the seeds in a community to directly talk to those who had abortions and in a way that doesn't offend, doesn't push them away, but says we're here to provide healing. Let's do the uh, prayer for our battle plan. Okay. <laughs> the, uh, the battle plan is basically, you know, it actually, and it's, it's a prayer, but I, I, everybody's heard this, but I don't want uh, you to think of it as a prayer. I want you to think of it as a recipe from a spiritual master where if you follow certain steps, you get a good cake or for programmers out there it's like a algorithm that where you follow certain steps you're going to get the right results in a computer program but this is a spiritual master gave us this prayer and the reason I like it so much uh, is because it really addresses all the issues we've been talking about over that post abortive women and men face the things they suffer the things their struggles their obstacles this is the spiritual uh, way to bring about the transformation not only of individuals but our society. It really gets back to the basics. And it's really simple, and join me please. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there's hatred, let me sow love. Where there's injury, pardon. Where there's doubt, faith. Where there's despair, hope. Where there's darkness, light. Where there's sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant they may not seek, they may not seek so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, it is in dying that we are born again into eternal life. This is the masterful recipe for how to he Heal and help those who are hurting in despair, sad and despairing. 
and this is what you can do. And I think it's really the most important part of all this plan. We can talk about the politics and education, but it's really doing what Christ asked us to do, which wasn't go out and bring political changes, to go out and bring his healing mercy. And through that mercy, through those who experience that mercy, he will bring about all that we desire. Thank you. Join EWTN this January for three days of live coast-to-coast -coast coverage as millions take a stand for the sanctity of human life. First, EWTN takes you to the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C. for the opening mass of the National Prayer Vigil for Life, Thursday, January 23rd, followed the next morning by the closing mass of the National Prayer Vigil for Life, Friday, January 24th. Then, stay tuned as the faithful get moving with the March for Life, hosted by Catherine Hadro and Father Patrick Neri from our Washington, D.C. studios. And the next day.